Okay. Good evening. Welcome to our PVUSD board meeting. Uh, we do have a translation in Spanish. You can please see um, Virginia at the back table there. If anyone would like to speak to an item on the agenda, they must complete a speaker card and hand it in to Ava Renteria down there prior to the start of the agenda item. Each speaker will have two minutes and we know that it is very easy to lose track of time and how long you've been speaking, especially if you're unaccustomed to speaking in public. So um, Vice President Shocker has a 30 seconds, you know, warning card just to kind of help you know, keep you on track. Can we, can oh, we oh, we're, so we, we, each speaker has two minutes and it's limited to two minutes. So I do see, you know, some new faces here this evening and I want to take a moment to just establish some ground rules. There may be differences of opinion, sometimes strong differences, and please give those speaking the same respect that you would like to receive when you are speaking. This will allow everyone to be heard and the board to conduct its necessary business. So we will move to um, 3.2, the Pledge of Allegiance. Trustee Soto, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We'll move on to item 3.3, our superintendent comments. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. So um, in just a minute, I'm gonna share some exciting information that's, that's up on the screen. But prior to doing that, I just wanted to provide some context and information. So as we know, we, we unfortunately, we do um, continue to have some vacancies. And so due to that, we are asking our many teachers to be able to um, work during their prep time in order to be able to cover those classes. Um, and so one thing though that I did want to do is um, I am try to be data driven. And so we have looked at, um, we review the numbers of the subbing on prep between August 16th and September 17th. And due to the timing of the supplemental payroll periods, um, all teachers who sub during this time were actually paid on October 10th payroll. So that should have just happened. Um, the district um, required each teacher to sub on their prep and went through the contractual allowable rotation. Um, each teacher would cover approximately four periods over five weeks, which is less than one peri prep period a week. The district also required in the contract does offer teachers the opportunity to volunteer to cover through their prep, and so many teachers volunteered to cover these periods for the additional pay. Um, one thing that I do want to mention is there is currently um, only nine teachers during that period who covered at over um, 10, period, 10 periods over the five week period. So. While I understand that there are many who are um, providing prep um, support during their prep, um, only nine of them covered um, more than two preps um, per a week. And so I wanted to provide that information. Um, we did, we are starting employees of the month, so we're really excited. Um, we did, um, I embody um, CARES, PVUSD CARES, which, it, which stands for Connect, Accelerate, cover, um, enrich, and succeed. So we went and surprised people. It was really great. Our classified staff member of the month was Veronica Moran, who is the executive assistant for business services. Our certificated staff um, was Jack Bookie, who's a teacher at Radcliffe Elementary. And you can see in the picture, his whole class came out and celebrated with him. Um, and then our administrator was Peggy Pugh, who is the principal at Aptos High and with us you'll see her 
her office staff came and um, celebrated with her. So we appreciate um, those three staff members and look forward to continuing to um, recognize people throughout the months. And this is on our PVUSD website, so if you want to go see them throughout the months, they'll be there for us. And um, that is all. So we'll move on to item 3.4, our governing board comments and our reports on standing committees. So this is an opportunity for each of the board members to make a few comments and I, I just want to acknowledge that uh, trustees Acosta and Dodge Jr. have sent their regrets and will not be attending this evening. Um, but in terms of making comments, uh, we'll start with uh, Trustee Orozco. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. I want to start off my comments by thanking our community, our teachers, and PBUSD students and families for supporting our Nerville Minicon event. Um, this past October, it was well received by our community, and we had over 800 people participate. Uh, please make sure to save the date. We plan on having an even, an even bigger event with even more family-friendly activities um, on May 1st, 2022. As I want to thank you, uh, thank um, our district for um, co-sponsoring this past event and the one in May. I am also working with our City of Watsonville and City Mayor um, Jimmy Dutra on an evening with the mayor event intended to raise funds to decorate the poles in downtown Watsonville for the holidays. Um, so please stop by, the, uh, by this Saturday from 4, 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. at Staff of Live parking lot for our wine and beer tasting event. And if you're interested in sponsoring even a light pole decoration or a banner, uh, please make sure to get in contact with me. Um, and lastly, I am looking forward uh, to our Pajaro Valley Education Foundation meeting in the next week or so, in addition to our green team committee uh, meeting and DLAC. Um, and lastly, I do want to wish uh, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez a happiest of birthdays today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Trustee DeSerpe, did you have anything you wanted to say? Okay. Yeah. Trustee Soto? I defer my comments. Thank you. No, Vice President Shocker? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, it's been a busy couple weeks since our last meeting. Um, Migrant Head Start committee meeting um, was last week. We discussed the needs, or actually earlier this week, <laughs> of the program, specifically repairs at sites, computers um, that are needed, and new printers. Um, I was also available to, um, able to attend the Women in Leadership Conference um, put on by uh, former clerk Gail Pellerin, and I had some fellow um, women um, in that sem seminar, which was very interesting and very informative. Um, I've had some meetings with various community members, um, planning visits to sites now that we can um, safely visit sites again, and um, discussions um, range from needs in the community, um, planning fun art events for kids, um, upcoming city events. And then I also want to thank Gary Vargas and his team who are working hard and working on a plan at Renaissance to get the field reconditioned. So thank you very much, Gary Vargas and his team. Um, I wanted to not take a moment to acknowledge some donations uh, that are, you know, in our uh, consent agenda items. Um, much of what we do is based on the generosity of our community members. And for a, a exciting project that we've had, you know, ongoing for the Emerald Lagasse Culinary Garden and Teaching Kitchen project, we've continued to have uh, an outpouring of generosity from community partners. Melissa and Dean Walker, you know, donated $1,000, Kurt Schmidt, $500, Jeff and Adele Talmadge, you know, $1,500, and Rebecca Garcia, $150. And I just want to, again, extend my gratitude to everybody who's making these kind of innovative projects uh, possible. Um, item 3.3, our high school students board representatives report. Let's see, do we have any high school representatives? Yes, we have a, a virtual. Okay. Up to us high? All right. We are 
are the student representatives from Aptos High School. My name is Mia Archuleta and I am the ASB treasurer. My name is Alex Espetia and I am the ASB secretary. I'm Chloe Chelsea Garrett and I'm the ASB president. And I'm Jackson Miller, the junior vice president. Alrighty, so we're going to give you like a little rundown of the academics, arts, activities, and athletics that are happening here at Aptos High. Um, firstly with the academics, we just finished our first quarter of school, which is very exciting. Um, I know that a lot of seniors are um, hard at work at their college applications, um, and the English department has been helping us or guiding us through the essay writing process by creating assignments for the UC personal insight questions as well as the Common App essays just to help us um, in case that we need questions or some revisions. The counselors have also been um, coming into our social study classes to talk to us a bit about the application process and um, how to navigate Naviance um, as well as talking about letters of recommendation and the FAFSA and all that college stuff. Um, as far as like students coming into like school after a year off, I think everyone is kind of struggling a little bit but that's as to be expected after having a year off so we're all just kind of adjusting and I think the teachers and staff are doing a really great job at um, working with us instead of working against us. Um, as far as the arts at our school, the drama and theater department are working on their uh, production of A Midsummer Night's Dream which will take place outside due to COVID and that will start October 29th. So as far as activities go at Aptos High School, in the month of September, Aptos High has done a homecoming spirit week, a homecoming parade, a homecoming dance, and a homecoming football game. Um, in September, we also held elections for all the grades. And starting October 18th will be our college and career week, where colleges will be coming to do presentations and students can rep their college gear. The week following the college and career week is our Halloween spirit week, where we will have Halloween themed spirit days and fun Halloween themed lunchtime activities. We also had a huge success with our club carnival with 25 clubs participating and we are still doing our making waves weekly announcements and we usually show them every Wednesdays in our tutorial class and we will be starting the second harvest food bank with the interact club. Uh, as far as athletics go, our boys football team have had a great season. Our girls volleyball team are nearing the end of their season. Our girls golf team has been doing great as well. And both of our water polo teams have started their own seasons. We're also about to start going into the basketball seasons, both boys and girls, which is going to be a great time for the winter sports. And of course, all of our seasons are, or all of our sports are continuing under correct policies and staying safe. And that's us from Aptos High. Thank you. Thank you, Justin Miller, again, with just a few things that I didn't add to the sports section. Uh, the first thing is that our football team is actually currently 6-1, and one, which is at the top of the standings. Uh, our cross country is doing great with many of our girls competing for first, which is great. Uh, a new team, yes, the surf team, is starting this weekend. And our girls' tennis is actually undefeated in league play. Uh, our girls' water polo team has a pretty good shot at CCS this year. And when it comes to dance, cheer, and song palm, our dance program is the best in the county. Our cheer is competing in December, and our song palm actually just qualified for nationals, which is great. But that's it. Thank you again. Great. Well, go, go Mariners. All right. So um, do we have any other high school representatives to speak? Okay. All right. So we'll move on to item 4.1, our approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Um, we have a public comment. On oh, okay. Sorry. Um, Chris Webb. Um, I'm just wondering if it's at all possible to move the report and discussion items as early as we possibly can. If not, I understand. He requested to remove report and discussion items move ahead. To, no, to, to, move move to move them up. Mm -hmm. I'll entertain a motion from. I 
I'd like to keep the agenda intact. I, I don't feel like it's packed with a lot of things. It's sen essentially we're going to go through our regular items and then we go directly to report. So I don't think okay. we need to change anything, actually. Chris, I think it'll be okay. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to approve the agenda. I'll second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries, uh, 502. All right, item 5.1, approval of September 15th, 2021 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? Move to approve. Do I have a second? A second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, 502. For 5.2, approval of the September 22nd, 2021 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? Move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion also carries 502. All right, item 6.1, our public disclosure of collective bargaining agreement between PBUSD and CSCA. Report will be presented by Clint Rucker, our CBO. Thank you, President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. Um, tonight, we are going to present to you the uh, AB 1200, which is also known as the public disclosure. Uh, government code actually requires that, uh, due to the fact that we have a COE as our fiscal oversight, anytime we come into an agreement with either bargaining units, we must actually bring it for a public hearing and available for public comment. So we are bringing um, our AB 1200, which you'll see if you look through the entire document, um, is an increase for uh, classified a one-time payment of roughly around $2.2 .2 million with statutories of, if I remember correctly, about 770000 puts you to a total cost of about $2.9 million for the classified unit. Um, the majority of this is one-time. It is not ongoing, so we're using our fund balance to pay for this. There is a small ongoing increase due to vacation ratio that we did give uh, classified employees two extra days of vacation. As some of you may know, our 11-month employees are not actually granted time to take vacation, but rather paid out for that vacation. So they did have that small increase to ongoing pay. But overall, the majority of this um, agreement is in one-time payments. Because this was not in our initial adopted budget in July, there is a budget revision that the board will also be approving as they approve the TA upcoming if they do so in the action item. So just be, be aware that we will be doing a budget revision that you'll see at first interim to go along with this report. Um, and at this time, I'm happy to take any questions from the board or if the public has any comments. Do we have any uh, speakers on this item? We have no speakers. Any questions or comments from the board? Okay. I just have one question. So we added two extra vacation days, and I saw that on, on the report it said that there would be no cost to the district, but really there is a liability later on if those are accrued over time, right? Absolutely, and the letter that actually came from the COE does address that there could be a potential liability yeah. from those two days, but in terms of ongoing costs that the district will see, um, we would more see it in a one-time payment out if an employee left with those days, but we won't see an ongoing hit to our budget each year. So yes, the liability yeah. slightly increases, but yeah. we won't see a okay, thank increase, you. of course. I guess just one last comment for I'm just happy that we're settling and that we're providing that $2,100 stipend to our classified employees. So thank you for all your hard work. Of course. And thank you so much. Thank you, Clint. And if, um, I, I know there was some activity in the back. If you're here to speak on item 7.1, which is visitor non-agenda items, the cars need to be in now. All right. So going on to Item 7.1, public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda item. Our agenda for this evening, please know that though the Brown Act prohibits the board from engaging in discussion for non-agendized items, we are listening. Do we have any public speakers? We do, President Holm. So I'm going to call um, three speakers up and just stand, please, six feet apart, and then um, take your turns at the podium. First, Carol Bjorn, Carolyn West, and Matt Montgomery. Go ahead. 
Good evening. My name is Carol Bjorn. I'm here tonight to oppose all California Department of Public Health mandates that have been implemented in our schools, including facial coverings, quarantines, testing, and vaccinations. The Holocaust did not start with gas chambers. It started with one party controlling the media and information. The same is happening here in America today. There is no isolated SARS-CoV-2 virus. Thus, it cannot be said that the SARS-CoV-2 virus causes the disease COVID-19. Thus, the mandates that tell us will slow the spread of COVID-19 are meaningless and ineffective. I provided for you tonight um, the instructions for the PCR test. I got this from the FDA's website. It's on your, I put your name on every one of them, and I printed three pages from the instruction to the PCR test, which is a CDC document. Um, I'll point you to page 38, detection of viral RNA may not indicate the presence of infectious virus or that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is the causative agent for clinical symptoms. Further, this test cannot rule out other diseases caused by bacterial or viral pathogens. So even in this document, um, if you get a positive PCR test, it doesn't rule out something else causing the positive PCR test. Um, so this has actually been a, a, a more... A, Sorry. And I want to point your attention to page 40. Um, it also says there has been no quantified virus isolates. Further, Christine Massey has documented on fluoride free peel. Um, over 100 public record requests has been um, issued to hun over 100 governmental agencies around the world asking for an isolated virus. Everyone has responded they don't have it. In the packet I provided on the last page, you'll see my friend submitted a records request from California Department of health, they do not have a SARS-CoV-2 virus. So all the mandates that they're issuing to you all, they don't have the backup to provide proof if anybody goes to court and people say, okay, show me the isolated virus, it's not there. So I would like for you tonight to rescind all mandates. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Carolyn West. I'm one of your school nurses. I'm not quite sure how to follow something like that. Um, <laughs> um, I've been a nurse for 28 years and I support science. I believe in science. Um, I believe, you know, it's the basis of my career. And I have seen people with COVID. I have had people who've lost family members to COVID. We are working desperately in the school district to protect our students and protect our staff as much as possible. Is, is it worth negotiating this in lieu of something that has been proven to make a point? This is not a Holocaust, and I think that's offensive to people who actually experience the Holocaust to, to draw that analogy. Everybody is working really hard I am working really hard. <laughs> we are all doing the best that we can. And to support pseudoscience like that and, and misinterpret things that are out there is not, is not science. Our teachers are working so hard. I love the teachers. I love you guys. You guys are all working so hard. And I, yeah. They are. I have five schools. I have five schools <laughs> that I go to, and everybody is really working hard. My health assistants are working hard, and for somebody to downplay how serious this is is very upsetting for me. <laughs> we're all pushing through, and we're all doing the best that we can. I don't know that I had any point, but I did want to acknowledge the teachers. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. May I begin? Thank you. Good evening, board. Uh, two months ago, we saw this board, to its discredit, I think, endorse a motion in support of the failed California Department of Public Health's mask mandate. Board President Holm, you brought up your medical background and said something along the lines of, I've never heard someone ask a surgeon to remove their mask. That got me interested. I looked up masks and surgeons, masks in the operating room. What are their effects? If anything, we should expect a mask to have a big effect in the operating room. 1991 study in the World Journal of Surgery by Tunaval looked at over 3,000 operations. After operations performed with face masks, 
4.7% rate of wound infections were recorded, but only 3.5% had infections in the no mask group. This difference was not statistically significant. 2009 review by Bali found, quote, no significant difference in the incidence of post-operative wound infection was observed between masks group and groups operated on with no masks. 2013 review of surgical masks by the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health. Key finding, the use of surgical face masks by staff in the operating room is presumed to reduce the frequency of surgical site infections. The evidence identified and included in this report finds no evidence basis for this presumption. 2016 study in the Cochrane Review by Lip and Edwards found, I quote, three trials were included involving a total of 2,113 participants. There was no statistically significant difference in infection rates between the masked and unmasked group in any of the trials. The evidence is clear that masks have no effect even with trained medical staff. But somehow six-year-olds are going to wear them properly and they'll have an effect this time around. That is the real pseudoscience. Thank you. Next speakers, Courtney Beam, Elizabeth Thorne, and Lucia Martinez. Hi, my name is Courtney Beam, and as a parent of a child that I'm constantly getting comments or calls from the office at the school because she's not wanting to wear her mask or she's saying her mask is uncomfortable, I have to agree with everyone that has came up here and said something about the mask policy. I mean, it's got to go. I mean, you're not... It's too much for our children. The, the, the way that they spread it is so minimal. I mean, for us also to have the lowest rate right now of transmission, and we're still requiring it, but yet we are allowed to have businesses that are open. If you're fully vaccinated, you can walk into without a mask, but you can't walk into a school. It doesn't make any sense. It, it's, it's double standard, and that needs to be addressed on the next board meeting is the mask again. I mean, it's not okay. My six-year-old is tired of wearing them. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Thorne. I'm one of your nurses, but you guys already know that. I'm actually here to represent Watsonville High School. I'm one of the union reps for Watsonville High, as well as the nurses. I'll get to the nursing part in just a second. There are over 100 teachers at Watsonville High. How many teachers do we have here from Watsonville High tonight? <laughs> The reason why we have these guys is because they want to see change. They want to see that they are supported, that our board is supporting Watsonville High School teachers. Give us the COLA money that you guys got. Give us a raise, okay? Yes? Yeah. Give us a raise. Give us a raise. Each one person who's going to come up here, they're going to say the same thing. We need to see change. I have at least 80 other teachers who would love to be here, but they're burnt out and they are disappointed and disheartened right now because they don't think change is possible. And that is very disheartening. It's very disheartening to me. And I know it's very disheartening to them. Okay? So please, give them a raise. That's all I'm asking. Improve the working conditions would be great, but give them a raise. Don't use the COLA for the SROs. Do not use the COLA to provide something else other than a raise for our teachers, okay? All right, now I'm gonna talk about the mask thing. A study in Nature says exactly the opposite of what these guys have been saying, but you guys already know that. I'm grateful that you are having us wear masks. Our rates are down in our schools because of mask wearing and vaccinations, okay? Watsonville High School, I'm happy to say out of the 2,500 students, only 1,000 are unvaccinated out of 2,500 students. That's amazing and I'm extremely grateful for that one as well. We're also 99.9% uh, in alignment with the mandated vaccines at Watsonville High. Yay! <laughs> Thank you all for the work you do. Keep up the good fight. Mm -hmm. Calling people up. Is that turned in their cards? 
I'm Lucia. You call my name. Did I say I'm sorry, Lucia? Yeah. I apologize too. Hello, good evening, Superintendent, board members. My name is Lucia Mecca Martinez. I go by any pronouns, and I'm ASB co president of Watsonville High, as well as the Sexuality and Gender Acceptance Club um, president and proud member of the LGBTQ community. Sorry, this gets me very emotional. Um, being an LGBTQ student is very difficult. Many of the transgender and gender non conforming individuals, in particular at school, can attest to this fact. When there are no locker rooms for gender non-conforming students only for boys and girls, making PE a very uncomfortable experience to change when you don't have a locker room that fits your gender identity. When the gender neutral bathrooms are always locked on campus, students like myself are forced to use bathrooms that don't fit our gender identity. It is painful and something I personally struggle with daily. So PBC passed a resolution about recognizing October, excuse me, October is LGBTQ plus history month. I do not believe PBC has followed up on the promises about supporting and up uplifting the queer and trans community, like in that resolution. This month, as well as June, PBC said they're going to raise the progress flag every day for the rest of the month. At school, they started putting the flags on Monday. This is almost two weeks of no pride flag up. And I know other campuses have done so too. Being in the LGBTQ plus community, we are often forgotten about, and it was hurtful to see that PVC forgot to put up the flag and not falling through on their promises to support the, my community. My question is, why do we not have the flag up all year round? Why don't we only support our students for four years, I mean, four, um, four days in June and only half of October? It's really disheartening to see, and it makes me super emotional to know that, or to see that, to not see the support from y'all when y'all said you would do that. In June, I spoke at the district pride flag raising as well as Watsonville High. And that was super um, amazing to see, but now it's like months later, I'm not seeing the same thing as that I saw in June. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I apologize if I mispronounce your name. It's hard to read um, for me, so. Elmon Gonzalez, Karen Osmondson, and Isaiah Castro. Uh, hello. My name is Herman Rafael Gonzalez, and I'm here on behalf of Empower Watsonville. Uh, before that, and before I talk about that, I'd just like to thank my co-president, Lucia Mecki Martinez, for giving that really powerful speech. I believe that her message, their message, incredibly, incredibly important, and important for all of you to follow up on. I'd like to share with you uh, a bit about Empower Watsonville, and I want to announce to the Board of Trustees and all of the members of our community that we will be holding a conference the 23rd of October. Um, me and my peers in Empower Watsonville have been working really hard starting uh, since the summer to bring this conference titled The Power of Healing um, to sort of support this healing that we as students, as members of the people USD community, especially hit by COVID and all of the different tensions and circumstances that have arise in this past year have brought. So I'd like to invite uh, the board members and everyone here to join and come to our conference the 23rd of October. Uh, it will be starting at 9 a.m. and going to 2 p.m. Thank you. Uh, oh, that's my bad. It will be at the uh, Watsonville High School. Registration will be at the cafeteria, and uh, the actual spoken portion and uh, keynote speakers will be in the Mello Center. Just want to share. Thank you so much. Thank you. My, my next. <laughs> 
Hi, my name is Karen Osmondson, and I am an ex-board member of 16 years, and I'm here to talk about Dr. Rodriguez. <laughs> um, so when we first interviewed her, all seven of us, seven of us voted for her. One, of, one was considering somebody else, but we talked her out of it, so all seven of us voted for her. And I think she came when, when she was first here. She actually, she actually drove to Watsonville before she interviewed and actually stayed here, in, I'm pretty sure four days, to learn all about our schools, all about our district, all about our programs. Pretty cool. Um, hopefully I can do this in two. <laughs> she, also, she always went to my committee meetings, especially for DLAC, and in Spanish, obviously. She speaks Spanish. Uh, we haven't had a superintendent can do that. Um, she, has, she, she does, I'm trying to list it all. She, she's the only superintendent has, who does the state of the district, where we have you know, our state of the district, we have all kinds of community members, people from all over the community there, and it's really a wonderful thing, speakers, and it's great. Um, she, she actually gives a presentation for her, value, for her evaluation, which we have never had before. Um, we never had that happen. She, <laughs> she, um, she has a new curriculum um, that she has, you know, organized and put in our school district and our students are advancing every single year. She has a Ask Dr. Rodriguez, which you've never had before, so people can ask her all kinds of questions and she answers them. Um, she has, um, she has done so many things. <laughs> um, she, she's also received all kinds of kudos from organizations here in, in the Watsonville and county area, and also she's received kudos from all over the country about all of her work. Um, she has, let's see. Sorry, um, it's time. She, she works harder and longer than any other superintendent we've ever had. We haven't had superintendents that work Karen, as hard or as long. Oh, no okay. So, <laughs> thank you, sorry, <laughs> I was gonna do it too. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Uh, hi, my name is Isaiah Castro. Uh, I'm a teacher at Watsonville High School and proud member of uh, PVFT. Um, my first comment uh, that kind of got brought on by things that were said before, um, I find when people speak on COVID and try to liken it to horrific events that happened in the past, um, they tend to come from people who have not, one, experienced these type of things or come from people who have never been a minority, who have been marginalized and left on the side to not have the same values as everyone else. Um, I understand masks are a pain. I hate having to wear a mask all the time because I like to see the smiles of my students um, or the mean faces they make at me sometimes if I'm giving them too much homework. Um, but it is what it is. And for people to say that masks are uncomfortable, think of the children. My daughter's five years old and goes to kindergarten and wears a mask in a school where they have school mandates and mask mandates. And they wear them all. And I have yet to hear any of her, her friends or herself say masks hurt them themselves or they make them feel uncomfortable. So I just want to get that out of the way that if most kids can wear them, I think um, all kids can wear them. It's not that big of a deal. We all had to wear them for over a year and a half. The second thing is PVSD cares and I see that everywhere. I see that on my students' laptops when they open them up and my students look me in the face and laugh and say, do they really? And I have no answer for them because I feel like we preach at a high level that PVSD cares and we implement. Connect, accelerate, recover, enrich, succeed. But when they're teaching positions that are left vacant, classes that are being converted to ingenuity for credit recovery because they cannot be filled, that's not caring. And I feel like if we really did care about how our students are doing, we would provide adequate funds in order to make sure that teachers can be hired and that teachers that are already here, like myself, don't feel like they're burned out every Monday of the week. And I know the union has- Isaiah, we're at time. Oh, awesome. Thank you. We have meetings. Please come join us, board members. Thank you. Next, Emily Caver. Oh, I was going to speak to a specific issue. Is, is this for everybody? Okay. I was going to speak to the seventh nine point. Nine point. Okay. We just got nine point zero. Nine point three. 
Make way three. Make way three. Okay. No problem. So I'll go back to point three. So Jessica, Travis Walker, and Allie. Hello, everybody. I had to write something down because I'm super tired, so. Hello, everybody. My name is Jessica Carrasco. I'm a social studies teacher at Watson High School. I teach 10th and 11th grade world history and U.S. history. This is my third year teaching at P PVUSD, so I'm, fairly, I'm a fairly new teacher. But even so, my relationship to this community is incredibly strong. Many of you on the board already know me and the work that I do in Watsonville. But for those of you who don't, I'm a local artist that creates visual art and uses parts of the profit to create scholarships for high school seniors, students that attend PVUSD. I'm a community organizer and I have been advocating for the arts youth and a better all quality of life for those that live and work here in Watsonville. I grew up here, I played soccer here, and I attended all PVUSD schools. I specifically came back to Watsonville after graduating from San Jose State because I wanted to work in my community. I wanted to specifically work with students that looked like me, spoke like me, and who shared similar struggles through our educational experience. I believed that because I was once a student of this district, I myself would be able to assist them in a very unique way. I'm here today to share with you that I do have many concerns about teacher vacancies, COVID, and campus safety. But my primary concern is teacher pay. The reason why is because I would want to stay in this district and work for many years. But in order to do that, I need to be able to provide for me and my family. Since I got to this district, I keep hearing teachers say how we're the lowest paying district to teachers and how eventually they'll find something better. Often teachers, um, often students ask, why do you teach here? Don't they pay more in Salinas and Santa Cruz? This year, Watsonville High School lost about half of its social studies department. There were teachers who I was very excited to work with in person because I heard they were brilliant at their job. Unfortunately, many of those teachers are gone. They left because there was way too much being asked and too little pay. I generally want to work here, but if the board can't prove to me with their votes that I matter and that my work matters and don't increase teacher pay, I don't think I'm going to be here very soon. I ask that the district increase teacher pay immediately. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Travis Walker. I'm also a teacher at Watsonville High School. Um, I've been here for a few years, uh, and so I remember the 2018 WASC report of Watsonville High School, and one of the suggestions in there was that Watsonville High School needed to do a better job at recruiting and retaining qualified staff. What have you done to address that issue? Because the problem has only got worse since I've been here. Uh, in your most recent press release, you um, at least suggested that Watsonville or PVSD's teacher shortage is a result of the pandemic and the statewide teacher shortage. We've been in a pandemic for not even two years. There's been this issue at this district for a long time. Um, the need for teachers shouldn't be something that we have to come here and like ask you to do something about. I asked my students um, how they felt about the education that they were receiving at PVUSD. And in that conversation, one of my students said, I just don't feel like anybody cares about me here. And that was a shocking comment to me. And so I asked the rest of my class, how many of you feel cared for in this district, that this district cares about you and your education? Not a single student raised their hand. So I asked my students to share why they felt like they weren't being cared about in this district. Students talked about not being able to access socio-emotional counselors. The school board just decided to bring back SROs instead of providing more socio-emotional counselors. They talked about, I had a student who talked about, she's been here for four years, she's a senior, she has never started a single school year with a math teacher. Every single year she hasn't had a teacher. I had students who talked about how they had to stand in our quad for the entire 110 minute block 
because they didn't have a sub and they didn't have a teacher and there were so many classes that didn't have subs and didn't have teachers that there was nowhere left to sit in the quad. How can we say we're doing what we're supposed to be doing here if we can't even put right teachers time. in a classroom with students? Hello. So I got here and I saw everybody sitting down and I was so impressed with everybody on their laptops. I was like, dang, the teachers are organized, they are ready to speak to the board, and it took me a second to realize that they're all working. They're grading, they're planning, they don't have time to rest because y'all don't provide them with that aid, right? There's a huddle of teachers back there on the floor working on their laps with pencils, right? That speaks on y'all and how you continue to fail the district in so many different aspects. Um, how many teachers aren't here because they're too busy and this meeting is not accessible? How many aren't here because they don't believe in y'all, like most of us really don't believe in y'all? And how many aren't here because they're scared of the consequences because bullying goes all the way to the highest level, Michelle Rodriguez, right, and then her superintendents and then everybody else? The teachers feel like they can't come to the administrator because they're going to have consequences for speaking out. That's how you show that you care. That's the environment that you've built and that's the reality of it. The money used for SROs must go to teachers. You all know that. You know the data. You know that SROs don't prevent what you call conflict. And you know who does? Teachers. Um, my kid is in Baltimore High School. They have found supporting teachers, but they have no counselors. So how many of your teachers are also being counselors? How many of your teachers are doing everything? And you're not paying them enough. You're devaluing them. And I know plenty of teachers that have left this last year alone because of it. So you're doing a disservice to my children, and it's it's harmful, and y'all need to change before they leave us. Um, my kid is a fourth grader, and they have SPD, which is a, a sensory processing disorder, and she loves wearing her mask. It does not bother her in any sort of way. It makes her feel safe. There has been no cases, and I have not been worried about my daughter's safety in the schools, so I appreciate the mask mandate, and I know that at least in that aspect, we can count on you. I just wish that we could count on you forever everything else. Okay. Jorge, Bernie Gomez, and Jenna. Jorge, what? Um, is it Manriquez? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay, my name is Jorge Manriquez. I work for Watsonville High School, my department, and I have been there maybe 20 something years, 23. I'm a math teacher and I don't know how to count. Okay, <laughs> since I got to Watsonville High School, 1998, the next year we needed one or two teachers. To make this sure, Every single year, we needed one, two, three, up to four teachers in my mother apartment. Every single year. The only year I remember that we didn't hire any new teacher was when PV High School opened, because they got 400 something students for us, and that's great. But now things are kind of looking different. Yeah. Now we don't need only teachers every year. We used to cover them, we used, we used to get them. Now we need teachers and we cannot get them. Yeah? And then the problem is that as a math teacher, I see firsthand the academic struggles for those students with subs, subs, subs the whole year long. And nobody, not, none of those students fail. All of them pass to the next level. And then I get them. But I have to review fractions, I have to. I get to review number sense, I get to review fifth grade math sometimes. You know what, guys? This cannot continue like that. Can you please do something the other districts are doing to get teacher? Or do something the other, other districts are, uh, are not doing? But do something, please. Because this is a disservice to the students, a disservice to the community. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, hello. Uh, buenas tardes, y'all. Uh, I ain't being nothing prepared or anything, kind of just listening what what the teachers and the students are saying, right? And uh, a couple things come to mind. Uh, here, teachers asking for help for better raise, right? They're overworked. They're stretched th stretched thin, right? Uh, yet you drag your feet, right? We uh, hear from uh, the LGBT community, my relatives, right? For help, for assistance, for acknowledgement, and you drag your feet. Um, we experienced uh, lateral violence in Aptos last month, and you were quick to jump on the cop bandwagon, right, as a solution, spending $1.2 million on a, a, a practice that that even the uh, superintendent provided y'all with some uh, concrete data saying that SROs uh, are actually harmful, right? Uh, but, I mean, who, who's, uh, who's, to ignore, who's to ignore data, right? Who's to ignore the, the facts? Um, also, you know, Rodriguez, you know, she gets paid a hefty salary. I believe like $140,000 salary or something like that. You know, give or take. Um, I wonder how much the teachers are getting paid, right? Um, I wonder how much those SROs are going to be getting paid. Um, I think your decision to bring the SROs back was, again, it was a hard position for anybody to be in, but it was the wrong position to, for you to be in. Um, I think uh, the same way you're, you were ready to jump on that bandwagon is uh, you should be ready to jump on supporting teachers and students, you know. Uh, you have $36 million that came down from the ARPA funding, right? Uh, so I'm wondering what's, uh, what are you doing with that money? What's your vision for it? Uh, also, in regards to the MOU for the SROs, uh, where is it at? You know, we want to see it. We want to read it. What are the safeguards? You know, are the, stu at time. Are the students going to be uh, given the, you know, provided with the rights? You know, are the parents going to be contacted when they get harassed and, uh, and interrogated by these SROs, right? So I just uh, thank you. Marilyn Garrett and Chris Webb. Researcher and author, Arthur Furstenberg, wrote a book called The Invisible Rainbow, a history of electricity and disease, which shows each time there's been an increase in electropollution in the environment, there's been corresponding illness and mortality rates. He wrote an article called The Wrong Pandemic. And he speaks of wireless microwave technology, the launching of thousands of satellites into the ionosphere, which upset the electric circuit of the Earth, which provides energy for all life. I've been coming here for years talking about and calling for removal of Wi-Fi, massive harm to the students and staff alike. Here's some facts. Cell phones, cell towers, Wi-Fi, wireless smart meters, and microwave radio frequency radiation. Independent research shows this radiation causes cellular stress and damage, DNA damage, blood-brain barrier disruption, increased cancer and tumor risk, decreased melatonin, insomnia, abnormal heart rhythm, strokes, altered brain waves, cognitive difficulties, memory and concentration, hmm. headaches, links to Alzheimer's, and impacts to wildlife. And children are especially vulnerable. Just two websites I'll mention. Stopsmartmeters.org 
and cellphonetaskforce.org. And it turns out that graphene oxide is in the vaccines. Mm -hmm. Graphene oxide is a conductor, so people become like walking cell towers. Graphene oxide, never heard of it until this last year. Thank you. Um, I wanted to express my appreciation for uh, uh, Trustee DeSerpa's wariness of private entities experimenting our stu on our students. And I'd like to see the board um, do more uh, of that, like being cautious when it comes to initiatives coming from the district office. I say this in reference to the multi-tiered support system supplanting uh, Renaissance High School's Model Continuation School Award-winning Student Progress Monitoring System. I'm also referring to Sloan to Grow, Restorative Practices, and PBIS, not because those initiatives are bad, but because the implementation of them could have been better. And to the extent that they displace effective structures, that is bad. Um, teachers should be trained fully on these initiatives before they're rolled out. And school site leadership should be worked with to implement these initiatives uh, to the extent that they can bring positive change. I also wanted to say that I thought it was wrong at the last board meeting um, for Dr. Rodriguez to pull a sort of bait and switch on the issue of teacher vacancies. A handful of teachers exercising their right to use personal days is not why the district has vacancies they are that they're struggling to fill. A genuine answer on that would have shown not uh, sub pay relative to other districts, but teacher pay. And going back to my earlier point on um, undermining effective structures at sites, that's another genuine factor that's um, driven teachers away, at least at my site. Um, and it exacerbates stress put on teachers, which would make them want to use more personal days. Teacher uh, and education vacancies may be a state and national problem, but the low base teacher pay is a particular PVSD problem. Thank you. That's it. All right, we'll move on to section eight, our employee organization comments. Now is the time we hear from our employee organizations. Each will have five minutes. Do we have anyone from PVFT? Oh, hi, Nellie. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to the teachers who are here and the parents and support of the teachers and students as well. It's late. We're tired. Thank you for being here. It's important. Good evening, board. Dr. Rodriguez. The dedication and commitment of our students is evident as we spend time visiting sites and our teachers, students and teachers, um, and support staff. This is a wonderful um, experience to witness this, but then as we go delve deeper into the surface when we do our site visits, we see the emotional toll this school year has taken on everyone. Being back in person is not as smooth as we had hoped. We are short-staffed, as you are hearing tonight. We see many site administrators who have also stepped up to be in the classroom, and we appreciate you for having, um, doing, doing, carrying the support for your, uh, your teachers at your site um, and uh, trying to protect some of their um, pre prep release time. So thank you. Um, we feel for the hundreds of students who have yet to have a permanent teacher of record to provide consistent standards-based instruction, and most importantly, for them to build a relationship with during the school year. This has us thinking about the medical process of continuity of care. Continuity of care is concerned with the quality of care over time. It's the process by which the patient and the medical care team work towards a shared goal of high quality care. Well, our students need program trained credentialed teachers to guide and empower them with high quality instruction. Having a permanent teacher of record for the class is the first step in demonstrating that the student is valued. <clears throat> The PBFT has shared many times that our working environment is our students' learning environment. We base our advocacy on the belief that it is our students who win when we win. 
The district has not only received close to 100 million in COVID funding, the additional 5% cost of living adjustment to the base funding for the 21-22 school year alone is 9 million extra dollars. Funds that should go to salaries. To put that in context, a 1% raise for our unit is under a million. That is inclusive of all statutories um, and health benefits according to the CBO. Again, this benefits our students when, we, when they have teachers. Prioritize our students, invest in the educators that work directly with them. Tonight there are a couple of MOUs on the agenda, one addressing increase of um, pay during their um, lo the teacher's loss of prep. Um, we had also asked for um, a monthly during Wednesday's afternoons, um, every site, all the teachers have time at least once a month, two hours, to be able to address that loss of, time, of prep and release by having that opportunity to be in their classrooms, uh, complete their grading, plan their lessons, um, communicate, but that was, um, that was denied, but we are continuing to address the increase. Um, we're gonna continue to advocate for this with, um, with the district on providing time on a restructured Wednesday for teachers to have that inter uninterrupted prep that goes beyond the guaranteed four hours that we have in our contract for the school year on a Wednesday. Another is a bonus for, for new hires. We appreciate the district realizing that they need to add some strobe lights to the help wanted ad, but would have been slightly flashier had they agreed to compound the other hiring bonus for the hard to fill positions in math, science, and SEPA, so an additional 2,500. And to really round out the party, there could have been an increase on the salary schedule from the start of the year to help control the hemorrhage that we felt and are still feeling um, from this loss of teachers who went on to work in other surrounding districts. Um, item 9.13, 9 9 the continuity of service plan is about how the district will maintain the health and safety of students and staff. Last month we submitted a proposal asking the district to extend COVID leave for members who are either following the health systems checklist and staying home when they fail the screener, or those who must stay home with their young child if their child has to quarantine. The response was that they are not interested in covering this and that teachers can use their sick leave because it's the teachers that create the absences. Why are teachers being punished for following the quarantine guidelines? <clears throat> if a teacher loses their allotted 10 days for PN, for personal necessity, to care for their young child more than once, what happens then? It is concerning that there is no willingness to work towards an agreement to protect a teacher's leave bank, which ultimately is about ensuring people aren't showing up to work sick. Ex extending COVID leave can be covered by the COVID funding. To close, as we continue this year um, short-staffed and instead continually bl blaming the cost of health care, especially during this pandemic, and when the district refuses to protect the lead bank of its employees who are working in person, it does not paint a caring picture to um, address our health benefits um, on the agenda. We will work, continue to work with the district and hope that they are willing to collaborate with us. Thank you. So on to item 8.2, CSEA. Do we have anyone from CSEA? Hi. Are you here representing the California School Employees Association? I am, yes. My name is Mark Lowenthal. I was invited by the, by the, by the administration. Oh, no, Mark, you'll be at report discussion. Oh. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll see you shortly. Thanks. Any of the union leadership from CSA? Okay. Um, anyone from Pavam? All right. And oh, okay. Thank you. I'm a little shorter than everybody else. <laughs> Even with hills. So, uh, good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, Cabinet and community members. 
Uh, well, Para Valley Unified School District has 19 licensed facilities for child care and state preschools. I'm going to focus on our migrant programs. Currently shared between Child Development Department and Migrant Seasonal Head Start, we are serving over 150 agricultural migrant families in center-based programs. I'd like to share through the required licensing daily health checks, temperature checks, and increased health and safety precautions, we have been successful to not have to in, have any COVID-related closures, keeping our children and our staff safe. Our programs are going to end in just about two weeks. We are currently putting together some learning packets for our students to take with them as they exit our programs so they may continue their learning from November to April. And we are excited to see their growth come April. I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Lisa Sandoval. Apologize. Here's Angelica. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez and Cabinet. Just to add to what Lisa just shared, I just wanted to bring you to, to your attention that uh, in family childcare homes, between the two programs, we serve about 700 children during the season and some of them are year round. We contract in a combination with more than 90 licensed family childcare homes in Watsonville. And uh, depending on funding, many of these children receive services up to 12 hours a day, Monday through Friday. Um, as Lisa mentioned, in spite of the pandemic, we have been able to successfully serve the families during the peak agricultural season. Also, with KC support, we're working hard to standardize systems and protocols especially with goal setting as it relates to curriculum practices and as we work with families and children on mental health issues. I really want to thank you for allowing us to open the program this year as families go to work every single day thankful and happy for those services being provided. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, do we have anyone from CWA? Okay, we'll move on to our action items and start with item 9.1, approve tentative agreements with CSEA chapter 132 and the report will be presented by Allison Yazawa. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I have tonight our tentative agreement with CSCA for the 2021 uh, school year. So we opened negotiations with CSCA on May 13th, and we uh, came to closure on, on August 4th. We did take a little bit of time off for the summer, so we weren't negotiating all the way through. Um, but we did we did get to wrap it up right before the school, school year started. So the articles that we had, we did total compensation, leaves, and then we actually came back and sunshine vacation um, to, to help help settle this out. So the agreements before you, we did settle on a um, one-time payment of $2,100 to all unit members prorated by FTE as well as their calendar. Um, we did settle on two additional vacation days and as you heard from the public hearing, it, that's also the vacation ratio for the 181 employees who don't actually get the days but get it paid out. As well as um, we updated some language in the leaves article around absence reporting. We're moving to a um, an online absence reporting system and the language in the contract was a little old and outdated so um, we were able to come pretty quickly actually to some resolution on updating that so we can increase efficiencies of making sure that when we know employees are out we can get coverage needed in a much more efficient manner so we definitely appreciate um, CSCA's collaboration with us on it and, and bringing it to, to closure rather quickly so I um, hope to or move to hope you approve the TA tonight thank you. thank you do we have any public speakers to 9.1 no speakers do we have any uh, discussion from the board Let's I'd like to make a motion to approve I'll second. I have a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 502. All right, um, 9.2. 
uh, one-time payment for management, confidential, and professional services employees groups. Report will be presented by Allison. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, President Home Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So um, we have before you tonight the, our unrepresented employees. So those are our professionals, like our occupational therapists, our athletic trainers, ones that don't fall under the, the CSCA or PVFT bargaining unit, as well as our confidential employees um, and our management. So we are... Um, presenting to you tonight, again, a 2100 payment similar to that of CSCA for those groups, um, prorated based on, on FTE and, and their calendar as well. Um, so I request that you please approve this tonight as well. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No speakers. Any questions or comments from the board? I'd like to make a motion to approve. All right. Any a second? I'll second. Okay, have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 502. <laughs> All right. Um, item 9.3, our LGBTQ plus uh, history month resolution. Resort, uh, the report will be presented by Kristen Schaus, our assistant superintendent of secondary education. Good evening, President Home, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. The few folks with me today, so a little different than our, our typical resolutions as we've gone through them, um, really in response to our student voices too. So it would be hard to stand up here and not acknowledge Lucia's comments in regards to what she has felt like and what has occurred on a campus, and we can do better. It's also a reminder that our efforts in writing also need to make sure that they match when we're out at our sites. So I had an opportunity to talk to her as well as well as Rogelio as we were talking outside. Um, they'd like to still be part of our presentation this evening. Really am looking forward to saying we're making commitments. Now we got to make sure that the student voices are still coming forward when those things aren't necessarily being executed the same way that we have intended as a board of trustees and others. So with that said, uh, we're going to read through our, our lines of our resolution. We each have parts in these as well. Uh, so we hope that you will in enjoy some ad additional education in the area and really why, we, why we're moving forward to place additional supports in here. Whereas LGBTQ History Month is an annual month-long observance of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender history and the history of gay rights and related civil rights movements, which was founded in 1994 by a Missouri high school history teacher, Rodney Wilson. So shout out to the teachers that have all been involved in the process along the way. Whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board believes that the rich variety of the diversity of families and communities is one of our strengths, and furthermore believes that the strong community consists of supportive unit composed of various genders, orientations, cultures, races, ethnicities. And whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board of Education values, honors, and welcomes the diversity of our student body, our teachers, our staff, and our administrators, including the diversity of sexual orientation and the identity of our community. And whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board of Education recognizes that we have students and staff of all different grade levels and within the organization that are LGBTQ plus and or have LGBTQ plus family members and they deserve to be recognized and valued. Whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District has through our resolutions and our actions made a commitment to achieving acceptance through fostering diversity and inclusion in our staff, our school population, and in our curriculum. And whereas on July 14th, 2011, the Fair, Accurate, Inclusive, and Respectful Fair Education Act was passed and signed into law in California and mandates the inclusion of the political, economic, and social contributions of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people in the social studies and history curricula in California public schools. 
And whereas on July 14th, 2016, the California State Board of Education passed a new history social science framework that includes LGBTQ plus American history content to be taught in K through 12 classrooms. And whereas the Pajaro Valley Unified School District recognizes the important contributions of local, state, and national LGBTQ plus people to the history of the United States by promoting social justice, enhancing health and well-being, and building a sense of community for LGBTQ plus people. And whereas Sylvia Rivera and Martha P. Johnson, two trans women of color, were some of the significant individuals who stood up for LGBTQ, may I continue? Um, the LGBTQ rights at Stonewall um, riots in New York City in 1969, and whereas Harvey Milk, who was the first openly gay elected official in the history of California, and whereas local LGBTQ plus activists and allies for more than 45 years have preserved to, tra to transform the annual pride marches from tense rallies needing police and parade monitor protection into one of Santa Cruz's most joyful and beloved community celebrations. And whereas the local LGBTQ plus community and its allies rose up to meet the challenges of the AIDS epidemic, helped lead the state and nation in developing community-based strategies for reducing pain and suffering and took major roles in the statewide resistance of political attacks on people with AIDS, including teachers, that all despite suffering great and unrecoverable losses of friends and loved ones. And whereas LGBTQ plus individuals continue to make noteworthy and important contributions that have led and will continue to have great impact on our history, culture, and society. summarize the major pieces within this resolution, uh, whereas LGBTQ individuals continue to make the noteworthy con contributions, that our district supports the rights, the freedoms, the equality of those that are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, pansexual, and asexual. And whereas Pajaro Valley Unified School District affirms its role and its commitment to continuing the historical progress of transforming the educational system to ensure inclusiveness, safety, and a sense of belonging that all LGBTQ students, teachers, staff, and families. And therefore, be it resolved, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District Edu Board of Education celebrates the accomplishments of LGBTQ people in history, encourages all schools to celebrate October as the LGBTQ plus history month, and encourages teachers to teach lessons about LGBTQ plus history in their classrooms aligned with the state history framework, not just in October, but all year long. And with that, staff recommends approval of the resolution. Thank you. Um, why we have public speakers to this item. Yes, we have public speakers. First, I have a question. Um, Chris Kirby, are you speaking to 9.3 or 9.7? I wasn't sure of your... 3. 9.3? Okay. So you'll be coming up. Chris Kirby, um, Emily Caver. Oh, sorry, Emily Kazar. Thank you, Jennifer, for the invitation, and thank you for the board. Um, I first want to just say. We believe our God, our creator, is an awesome, perfect father, and he loves us all. Yes, God loves gays, God loves lesbians, he loves transgenders, and he loves straight people. We all have massive faults. And if I am a true believer of Jesus Christ, I should gladly give my life to save a transgender, a lesbian, a gay. That is what God Almighty would want me to do, as stated in our Bible in John 15, 13. What our local Christians, Muslims, Jews, 
Buddhists are asking this school board is that our public schools stop promoting and teaching our children to become gay, lesbian, or transgender for the simple reason of what happened to Kara Bell. This is Kara Bell. And the disinformation she read on the internet and social medias. Thanks to this information from Gender Identity Development Services, CARE thus started to take puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones at age 15, and had irreversible lifelong consequences. CARE then took her case to the United Kingdom's High Court and won a landmark case against England's only gender identified development service. You will not hear about Kara Bell in CNN, Facebook, or anywhere else. This is the same type of disinformation that Maria Risa just received a Nobel Peace Prize for her work on disinformation on Facebook and other social medias in the Philippines. Our children live off Facebook and social medias. Then you add a school with a transgender flag promoting transgenders. God loves us, and he loves you. And I love our children. And I want to see our children healthy. Amen. Oh. I'm Tom. Tom Myers. I just want to read you something out of the scriptures that the scriptures here that Simon referred to. This is right in Genesis. It said, Then the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. Then he slept. <laughs> and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Well, that's God's perfect plan for mankind, for a man to marry a woman. And you see that woman was taken out of a man, and then because it was the part of a part of man was taken out, and God formed a woman out of that. And then the wonderful thing about marriage between a man and a woman is that 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 is joined again. Part of Adam that was taken out of him is then joined to him again. And there's a complementary thing that happens, you see. A wife brings certain attributes to the marriage and a husband brings certain attributes to the marriage and they become one being and they complement each other. You see, with, with a, a gay marriage or, or that type of a situation, you have a woman and a woman and a man and a man and that, that compliment doesn't happen. So thank you. All right, so I got one other. Uh, I better move on. All right. Sit down. In 1 Corinthians, here we are. This is what it says. This is Paul speaking to the, his congregation there in Corinth. He said, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, Time's up. nor sodomites, nor thieves, covetous, Time is up. Time, all right, will not enter the kingdom of God. Time is up, Thank please. You. Thank you. Bye. Hi, I'm Emily Kassar. I'm a middle school teacher in this district. Um, I've been teaching here for 20 years, and I wanted to share a little bit about what I, I see in my school of what's going on. Um, in my school, we are definitely, the, the progress flag flies every single day. It has not stopped once. Um, so it is definitely up there. Um, my understanding is that it is there because there's a very high suicide rate amongst trans kids, that they are marginalized. In my school, what I, what I have seen is that they are not marginalized. Um, at this school. They are the popular kids. They are the most popular kids. The, um, there are a large number of trans kids, and they're generally girls, even though um, in the past they were men, usually boys. This is all girls, and they are the most popular girls. Um, the gay club is the most popular club in the school. Um, the kids, they, they get a host of privileges. They get to use the teacher's bathroom when nobody else can use the teacher's bathroom, which is never locked. The teacher, this 
students use it all the time. Um, and men, and like I said, they're, they're the popular group. Um, the flag for my kids gives a different message of what you'd expect it to do. What my kids pick up is that to be successful, to be popular, you need to be a trans. You need to be in there um, because those are the ones who are accepted in the school. Um, but it is, is this a good thing for them? Oh, not really long term. It's not good for their, if they end up going farther and taking puberty blockers, that is not a good thing. It damages their body quite a bit, and it really has no proof that it can be reversed. So we are in many ways sacrificing our healthy, a healthy puberty just so that the kids, so that these kids can feel accepted when already they are very, very accepted there. Um, the kids are being hearing the message of the LGBTQ a huge amount every most days in the announcements, probably two thirds of the days there are announcements about it. There are classes. The leadership um, class covers mainly that. We're at and time. Hear a lot. Thank you very much. Okay. Next, Courtney Beam, Leah Sugarman, Jen Salinas Holt. You had called me earlier. Can I go up first? Yes. Come on. Hi. My name is Chris Kirby. I'm a well, I'm a parent, but I've grown children. All four went through PVUSD, graduated in 02, 04, 09, and 15. So I'm surprised to find myself here, but I think it's important to talk about this K through 12. I have no problem with people and their choices of life. I, I mean, I understand it. I know people. I get it. I understand it. But I think the schools need to concentrate on teaching the subjects. I don't think the flag should be flying, especially in elementary school and junior high. Let these kids be kids. We're putting too much on them too early, and I don't think they understand it. It really freaks me out what these, I was at the fair at a booth last month. We had three different groups of girls come up to us in eighth grade and freshmen. And they were so confused, but they thought, it, it just really saddened my heart. You guys, I think K through 12 is, is way too early, or at least elementary and junior high is too early. Let them be kids. Let them... I don't know. It just really, it really hurts my heart what's being taught. And I will say the school district is even more screwed up than when my kids were here and I thought things were looking okay. You got to, I think we should restructure these schools and start with the pay of the teachers and then whatever's left at the top, you people all get. These teachers deserve our support. They are, it's a battleground out there and they are doing their best. I think we need more counselors to help these kids. And uh, it just really, I think it's very confusing for children nowadays. Okay. So that's my deal and I, I don't know. I'm. I'm really. I. I know you guys are doing your. You're doing your best, but it needs to be better for these teachers and the children. Thank you. Hi, my name is Courtney Beam, and I want to thank you for being brave enough to come up here and speak and say what you said earlier. It takes, that, that was really hard for someone your age to do. As you guys see in here, it says a Missouri high school teacher, high school. I am not okay with finding out that a school employee, that my daughter attends a K through eighth grade, a school employee went on Amazon and purchased my daughter a lesbian flag without notifying me? This has got to end. This is not okay. You want to know that my daughter, my eighth grader, while picking up her friend today, and my second grader, the coming out day where she, my daughter at a K through eighth school, this is young girls that haven't even hit puberty are still attending there. That have not even gotten their peers. That uh, the voice hasn't, like men haven't, like really, like this is not okay. My daughter tells me, mom, I went to the arch today and I came out. I said, what's that mean? She goes, well, it's where you tell everybody what you are. You're either a lesbian or you're um, gay. Or, and you want to know what my second grader says? I want to go through the arch. That tells you right now that you guys are pushing this 
on these young little kids, PBUSD cares, that's what you guys are handing out at an elementary school? This is not okay. No. <laughs> High schoolers, that is okay, why? Because they know and are way more educated. 30 seconds. <laughs> They're way more educated, okay? They have hit puberty. They can make sound decisions, but these second graders and eighth graders that you guys are giving incentive goodie bags for, for pre-signing up early for an event, is not okay. And I will go to the next higher level. <laughs> I have no idea what you guys are doing. And now for something completely different. <laughs> Good evening, trustees. My name is Leah Sugarman Rodriguez. My pronouns are she. <laughs> My pronouns are she, her, and ella. I'm a parent, a special educator, a PVFT member, and I want to thank you all tonight for your leadership and advocacy on behalf of LGBTQ plus students and families and their allies in recognizing October as LGBTQ plus month. Um, I brought some props. My daughter made this. And um, my husband and Francisco and I are um, proud parents of a first grader and a third grader at Alianza um, Charter School. And we are really so fortunate to be at a school that celebrates um, LGBTQ plus community and in events and where the whole school community uh, feels supportive of all different kinds of families and students. Um, I also want to introduce Wolfie. I wouldn't let my daughter come. This is Wolfie. <laughs> Wolfie uses they, them pronouns <laughs> after her favorite character from the Percy Jackson universe, um, Alex Fierro. Uh, I think it's really important that students learn about all different kinds of experiences. And I'm here tonight to urge you to include LGBTQ plus history in the primary uh, curriculum. 30 seconds. Um, California law not only supports LGBTQ plus students, but mandates that LGBTQ plus people are included in public school curriculum and that parents do not have the right to opt their children out of anti biased education. It should be up to individual, it shouldn't be up to individual teachers and principals to inform parents about this. This message needs to come from yeah, yeah, the so that families hear loud and clear that PBUST supports all LGBTQ students, families, staff, and all students. Good evening. I was um, going to bring some students with me tonight, and I'm so glad they didn't come and have to hear this kind of hate speech. I'd like to thank you for supporting LGBTQ plus students in our district and voting to affirm their identities by recognizing October as LGBTQ History Month. Visibility is crucial to the well-being of LGBTQ plus students, and seeing themselves reflected in their school curriculum has a lasting positive impact on their mental health and their sense of safety at school. Seeing the pride flag flying at school sites, which you all unanimously supported with the board resolution in February, is an important show of support and has contributed to students' sense of inclusion and safety at school, which directly impacts their academic success. We currently have gay straight alliance clubs in our high schools and middle schools. GSAs provide safe spaces for LGBTQ plus students and their allies to feel supported and valued. I have the honor of advising elementary and middle school GSAs at three school sites. Our clubs at Alianza and WCSA are the first elementary school GSAs in our district, and we have a number of elementary kids at both schools who identify as LGBTQ plus. Kids know who they are at a young age, and many queer and trans people know about themselves as young as preschool. Our GSA clubs are a lifeline for some of these students. 
LGBTQ plus issues are absolutely relevant to elementary school students. I have worked with students as young as kindergarten who identify as LGBTQ plus, as well as students of all ages who have LGBTQ plus family members. Including LGBTQ plus people in curriculum is mandated by the Fair Education Act, but more importantly, it affirms the identities of students and their families. This is literally life-saving work. LGBTQ plus students whose identities are validated and celebrated are at lower risk for suicide, self-harm, substance abuse, and other negative outcomes. Now is the time for the board to make a strong public statement in support of LGBTQ plus students. It's crucial that parents, families, community members, and staff hear from our district leadership that PVSD supports LGBTQ students and that parents do not have the right to opt out of anti-bias curriculum. I urge you to follow through with your commitment to supporting LGBTQ plus students okay. by making a public statement to the community in support of LGBTQ students, not just for the month of October, but year round. These brave students here are my heroes. Thank you. Elias <laughs> Gonzalez and Ellie. <laughs> Buenas noches. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I wasn't intending to talk, but um, after hearing our young folks talk over here, it's actually important that we talk about it. And it's unfortunate that we sit here in these types of spaces, and I can't even imagine what they're going through. And that's, in fact, in front of all of us here that are adults and dealing with this. They deal with this shit, excuse my language, on a daily basis. Um, so first of all, thank you, Ms. Shouse. I think it's important that you mention our words must match our, act must match our actions. PDUSD cares. I see a young lady here crying, breaking. I wasn't going to talk, but that is why we're here because of young people that are speaking up and talking about this. So I want to say first of all to all y'all, I hear you, I see you, I admire you, and I love you. Thank you. I see you. <laughs> that is what our students need. Our students need this type of support. They don't need this bullshit over here, hate crime and all this stuff coming into them. That's what they're dealing on a daily basis. On a daily basis they deal with this. So when we vote for SROs, we take this away from them. It's right here in front of you all. Whereas the Pajaro Valley Unified School District affirmed its role and its commitment to continuing the historical process of transforming. Transforming, what does transforming mean? Make a thorough or dramatic change in the forming, appearance, or character of. That's what they're asking for. They're asking for that transformation from you all. We can't give it to them. We've been here as a community. We've showed up as parents. We've showed up with their research, but we're not getting that here. I'll close it with this. Um, individuals, whereas LGBTQ plus individuals continue to make noteworthy and important contributions that have led and will continue to have great impact in our history. You made an impact on me. Thank you. That's why I spoke up. Okay? That is, we are trying to create leaders. We want to create leaders and not followers. So let's stop stepping away from the status quo of funding SROs and start funding young people that are needing help. Yes, we're at time. Thank you. My name is Ellie, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I studied the Bible until I was 16 years old extensively, so I can tell you, you take what you want from the Bible, and you'll choose hate. Um, girls have crushes on boys in kinder, and y'all are fine with that. Um, frankly, y'all sound ridiculous, and you should be embarrassed. People like you are why I fear for my child's safety every day every minute because because if I'm talking because of the hate that you spread I have to fear for my child's safety I am speaking and you will be quiet you should leave we would all be better off if you all just left to the board I recommend the book read by Michael Hall I read it to my six-year-old and she understood gender identity just fine um, ignoring them 
y'all need to train your teachers and your administrator. I had to pull my child out of the district for transphobic comments and because they were not safe in school, okay? The gender neutral lock, uh, locker rooms is a one single room. My kid doesn't want to do PE. They want to do sports. The teacher tells them you have to go to your uh, assigned gender. You need to train teachers to understand how harmful that is when you tell it to our students, okay? And we need to have gender neutral restrooms that are accessible and open so that nobody has to be asking for a key and I don't have to be worried that my child's gonna get a bladder infection because they refuse to go to the restroom the entire time they're on campus because y'all do not make that accessible, okay? So I really need y'all to train your teachers. I need you to support our students. I need you to make a safe environment. Y'all have so much. And I, I wish I would not have gotten disrupted by this hate because really we need to highlight our students and how amazing they are. And my kids showed me videos of the national coming out on campus and I was filled with glee because I remember That's in high same. school and I, and I know the difference that it's made in the last 20 years. So I hope that we can continue to support our LGBT students because you are not doing enough and I wish that you would do more. Do we have any discussion from the board? Okay, go ahead. Um, I would just like to make a comment. I was partially responsible for bringing our pride resolution flag forward in February, and I stand by that decision. And I think it's important to honor all of our students, and I am touched by their bravery today and every day that they live. I'm not gonna force students to fit inside a box. They are old enough to express themselves. They are old enough to have their own thoughts. And I hope for this world, not just our community, but this world, that someday we can find ways to accept each other. So with that, I would like to recommend passing this resolution today. Making a and I'll make a motion, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Anyone else? Second. Second. <laughs> Trustee DeSerpa, did you have a comment? Um, thank you for bringing uh, the resolution forward. I'm in full support. Did we get a second yet? Not yet. Okay, I'd like to, to make the second. I was proud to stand with y'all, and um, I'm sorry for um, some of the ugly comments that were made here tonight because that is um, does not represent our district or our administration or the people on this board, okay? Thank you for being um, brave, and thank you, Kristen, for bringing that forward. I have a comment as well. And, you know, first, we, you know, when I was growing up as a kid, it's like my confusion wasn't about who I was. My confusion was about what society wanted me to be. And, you know, when I got to adulthood and was able to acknowledge, you know, myself as somebody who is bisexual and to gain acceptance for that, that's where I found freedom and acceptance. And I have been very fortunate that I had parental acceptance, although that took some time, that I married somebody whose own identity is not threatened because they don't have a straight wife. This is incredibly important. And I have received quite a few emails in the past few days objecting to the measures that we have put in place to include the LGBTQ plus members of our PVSD community and particularly against flying the prog progress flag. When I compare these to the outpouring of support we received you know, earlier this year in favor of our measures, especially from those who have been the targets of homophobic and transphobic actions and speech, I am reminded of just why we need a resolution like this. These measures are a way of actively including a historically marginalized segment of our community. There are LGBTQ plus members of every religious denomination, racial group, ethnicity, 
whether or not they are safe to be public about it. This isn't about one group. It isn't about promoting one group over another. This is about recognizing the wide diversity of our entire community and welcoming all of its members. I will be enthusiastically voting in support of this resolution. Thank you. Are there any other comments? We have a first, yeah? I have one more thing to add. I just want to add one more thing. Um, thank you, Trustee Holm, for being brave. And thank you for leading the way. And I have a name, too, to share, Matthew Shepard. Mm -hmm. And many of those of you in this room will know who I'm talking about when I speak his name. And let's not forget all that he went through so that students could be here today and we can move forward in hopefully acceptance. So thank you. We have a first and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 502. Give you a hug too. All right. <laughs> For item 9.4, uh, our Rave Mobile Safety Application Contract report will be presented by Kristen Schaus. Uh, good evening once again, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, in resolution of the September 15th board meeting, um, it was decided that through that action, it actually increased part of our safety measures. This is one of those applications that I am bringing forward this evening, uh, which fits in alignment with what was presented that evening as well. So what is Rave Panic Button? It actually is an application piece. It runs on all cellular devices. Uh, the way that it works is that it instantly communicates through 911 simultaneously to staff on campus as well. So what that basically means is that as we are actually making the 911 call from our cell phones using the panic button, it actually is moving forward with whether it is fire department, health, or PD response. That response is going into distance Dispatch, it does not uh, impact any of their operations, but what it does do is push out to all of our staff that are identified for each one of those threads. So for instance, if we had a larger active incident, that would go to all of our staff through cell phone pieces in addition. If it was something that was a lower health status piece, but maybe a seizure or a piece that yes, we need others to know, it is applicable to all of our healthcare folks that are on campus in addition to our site administration, campus security, anybody that we put into the system to be notified for each one of those calls. A couple of pieces that you should know in terms of product value of, of what we're actually looking at. Uh, Rave is in over 10,000 K through 12 school districts, so you can imagine the gravity of the number of schools that it actually currently exists in. A couple of things that you may or may not be aware of. So FirstNet is a listed platform. So what that basically means is that it's certified after already going through a pre-evaluation to be fully interoperable. That means that it's actually talking to the authorities at the same time that it's talking to us to be able to connect those dots more seamlessly. It's also approved in the countries, um, our countries, so the United States of America, public safety communications platform. So it has been approved for use. Uh, Alyssa's law is something that came out um, of Stoneman Douglas. So if you recall, uh, an active incident and a shooting occurred in Florida in 2018. Legislation came forward to, uh, to Florida as well as New Jersey. Both of those states have accepted it. This actually hit the House floor as well in 2019. There's anticipation that this will go through. If this goes through, a product of such will have to be required for districts anyway. So at this point, California is not one of those states, uh, but as it has hit the, the House floor with anticipated um, legislation, we would actually be in front of the curve on this piece as well. And then lastly, Homeland Security has also certified the device uh, as a safety act piece within anti-terrorism as an effective use of technology for such. 
nice way to be able to, to give you a little bit of feedback as to how this actually occurs, and we'll play the video here for you. It's embedded on the top link. In today's world, time is everything. Can we get volume on that, please? When a critical situation occurs, every second matters. How do you know when and where an emergency is happening? How quickly are you informing others about In today's world, time is everything, especially during an emergency. When a critical situation occurs, every second matters. How do you know when and where an emergency is happening? How quickly are you informing others about an incident? How can you help 911 handle an influx of emergency calls? Do first responders know what's happening before they arrive on scene? How do they know what resources they need? Do they know the closest and safest access point to the emergency? The Rave Panic Button app is fully integrated with 911 centers. With a push of a button, the Panic Button app begins a communication workflow, instantly connecting you with 911, first responders, and necessary personnel, streamlining your emergency response. The app delivers critical response data, including details about the type of emergency and the location to 911 and first responders for a more coordinated response. First responders can quickly determine where to go and who needs help as they arrive on scene. An alert also automatically triggers mass notifications, digital signage, and more. Live streaming video allows 911 and first responders to view an emergency in real time to gather more critical information. Key stakeholders can initiate status checks with those at the scene to find out what's happening, where they are located, and who is injured. The Staff Assist feature allows authorized employees to communicate non-emergency information, such as minor medical incidents, security disruptions, and administrative updates to specific groups without calling 911. A customized content directory gives employees, teachers, and staff access to important information, like active assailant incident procedures, wellness guidelines, and quarantine protocols, so they'll be ready to act when the time comes. Stakeholders like you can also perform wellness checks with employees. Communicating instantly will improve your response times. The Panic Button mobile app is Safety Act certified by the Department of Homeland Security and the only solution with statewide deployments. You'll have the confidence knowing that you are doing all that you can to keep people safe and informed. So again, that's intro to, to Rave. It does allow us to geofence properties as well. So I know Dr. Rodriguez spoke previously about that. Um, that is a process piece that we will be going through. So if it's accepted, uh, essentially each one of the buildings that we have within our campuses, it will take us time to do the geofencing, but that will also, when you're using the panic button, alert to where that actual location is as well. And with that, I will open for questions. All right, do we have any public speakers to 9.4? No public speakers. Any uh, questions or comments from the board? Uh, just one for me, and that's sure. just, you know, we've been hearing about, you know, $1.2 million for the SROs, but it was, you know, a whole comprehensive, you know, program that we were talking about on the 15th. This is part of that? That's accurate. The, the same piece that Dr. Rodriguez spoke to that evening on the 15th is RAVE. Um, we actually had the dollar value in that as well. So the 1.2 that was approved includes this. It would not be an additional cost this evening. It was more for you guys as well as the public to be aware of where we're headed with the communications piece. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to approve. All right, I have a first, do I have a second? I'll second. All right, so I've got a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries, 502. Thank you. All right, item 9.5, resolution 21-22-15 in support of designating October 19th through the 29th as College and Career Awareness Weeks. Go ahead, Lisa Aguirre. Thank you. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. College Awareness Week is observed annually during the full week prior to Cabrillo College's College and Career Night. This year, PVUSD has chosen to expand to two weeks to move towards the county's alignment of the entire month of October. Cabrillo College will participate with several events they call College and Career Chats 
and UCSC EAOP Access Centers will participate with college activities in our family nights. The celebration is sponsored by the Santa Cruz County College and Career Collaborative, which offers additional resources to students and families related to college and career readiness. The little history with the college week in PVUSD, um, it started a while ago. Um, the first resolution and only resolution that I found was in 2016 by Dr. Rodriguez when she first arrived here in PVUSD. Uh, in the fall of um, 2017, um, we held our kickoff, annual kickoff event. Uh, this was co-created and collaborated in, um, with UCSC EAOP Access Center to decide on which events would be held. And it, like I mentioned, it aligns with the early decision college application process and Cabrillo College's Career Awareness Night. This year we are expanding it to two weeks. Um, in, to move towards the full month. Uh, the county, um, it was about three weeks ago, announced that they were going through the full month. Um, we want to move towards that for next year. Why we didn't do it this year for the full month is because it is our staff who's putting out the resources and the time. And we want to make sure that we do it the correct way, the right way with the available resources and we just don't throw it together. So we're doing it in a slow two weeks to a month next year. Some of the activities um, that are going to be occurring throughout the district um, for the full two weeks, there's going to be career, career exploration, um, there will be chats with the Cabrillo College, there will be student question and answers, college virtual tours, there will be door decoration contests, there will be teachers um, sharing their experiences about colleges, there will be information about um, financial aid availability, about the college application process, the A through G alignment, and many, many other items and options available. There's a full website put on through the, uh, the county career and college collaborative that was put up that are resources for school sites as well as um, many different additional resources that have been sent to school sites for ideas and different things that they can do. In addition, this year we're doing two college um, and career awareness nights for parents. They're going to be held um, on the Monday and the Thursday for this week, October 8, or for next week, October 18th and the 22nd. The 18th is going to be in English and the 22nd is going to be in Spanish so that all of our um, families have access. Um, and it's going to be in partnership with UCSC EAP office as well as our Family Engagement Center. In the future, we do look forward to expanding it to a full month to align with the county. Um, and with that, um, the resolution, uh, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District acknowledges that college and career awareness is central to our expanded definition of student success and an important part of promoting a college-going culture and serving the needs of all students and families in the districts. And whereas the vision of Pajaro Valley Unified School District is to graduate all students college, career, and life ready, and whereas PVUSD has demonstrated its ongoing commitment to establishing a college prepared culture through our yearly partnership with UCSC EAOP to establish access college and career centers in every middle school and high school regardless of gear up funding. And whereas PVUSD has established both dual enrollment courses and articulated courses with Cabrillo College to provide PVUSD students with an opportunity to earn college credit while in high school. Whereas PVSD believes in the family and community partnerships to support our students in their post-graduation plans. Therefore, be it resolved that the Pajaro Valley Unified Board of Trustees proclaims October 18th through October 29th, 2021 to be College and Career Awareness Weeks. And be it further resolved that the Pajaro Valley Board of Trustees strongly encourages all members of our community to join with its, in its personally expressing the importance of an education behind, beyond high school in order to fully contribute to the vitality of their community. Thank you. And with that, I ask for the approval for college and career readiness weeks. Great, thank you so much. Uh, do we have any public speakers to this item? No public speaker. Any discussion from the board? I'd like to make a motion to support this resolution. It's very exciting and thank you very much for all the hard work from um, to support opportunity for our students. Mm -hmm. I have a first, do I have a second? I'll second and I just want to um, elaborate. I think um, as we explore extending this to a full month, I think the financial aid literacy piece is going to be key. Um, I think uh, families need more than just a presentation on what financial is. Uh, they need a presentation on how it works and what it means when they receive their aid offer and I think that's 
um, often the the missing piece uh, that we failed to address. Thank so, you. with that, I'll second the motion. I don't think I, if I had already made a second, but <laughs> thank you. All right. I just have one comment to add. Um, knowing how important this is, and there's always a lot of questions from students and parents. Um, I think it's great that you have some online components, and so next year when we expand it to a month, tr going off of what Trustee Rosker said, to make sure that we have a couple different areas that we have a couple different dates for, and just allowing students. I think online's a lot easier than in person for most people, so making sure that we continue those options online next year. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 502. Thank you. All right, um, item 9.6 approved job descriptions. Our adult education transition specialist and adult education counselor report will be presented by Dr. Nancy Bilsich. Good evening. This is um, a, a great opportunity to have a transition specialist. A transition specialist now is at the consortium level. We have one um, at Cabrillo College. They have one at Santa Cruz County um, office, and we need one in PVUSD. This person is a little bit different than the counselor because their focus is working with the college personnel and trying to get that transition, the warm handoff, the building the rapport with the student, getting them ready to go to Cabrillo College. And they have transition specialist meetings right now, and so we are looking forward to having our own too. We think it'll be um, a real positive experience for our students. So with that, I would um, appreciate your support. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We have no public speakers. Any questions or comments from the board, Trustee DeServa? What a great idea. I think this will really provide extra opportunity for people to move on to different careers in higher education. So thank you for bringing it forward. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to support. Thank you. All right, I have a first, do I have a second? I'll second. If there's no further comments, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 502. Thank you so much. All right, item 9.7, resolution 21-22-13, our Williams textbook sufficiency report will be presented by Lisa Aguirre. Good evening again, board of, um, President of Home Board of Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez. On September 22nd, 2021, a public hearing was held for the sufficiency of textbooks at, per the Williams Act. This action item is to prove the resolution of sufficiency of textbooks that was presented at the public hearing. Thank you. Any public speakers to this item? No speakers. Um, all right, so any discussion from the board? Make a motion to approve. I have a first. Second. All those, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 403. Thank you. All right, item 9.8, Williams Quarterly Report, in July, August, September of 2021. Report will be presented by Allison Niazawa, Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Yes, I have the Williams Quarterly Report. So from the Williams Settlement, um, districts are required to adopt a complaint procedure process, uh, which we do have, um, as well as report on any um, um, Complaints we have received, and as you see for July, August, and September, we have received zero complaints, so I move to have you approve our quarterly report. All right, do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we have one. Radhika Kirkman. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, so I'm here to speak on the uh, Williams complaint. Well, yes, there were no complaints filed. Um, I do want to explain that because it's a little misleading when we put that out to the public. Um, the definition, according to the Williams report, of a teacher vacancy, which is one of the things that is um, what that is complained upon in this report, is 
A position to which a single designated certificated employee has not been assigned at the beginning of the year for an entire year or for a semester if that's what that position entails. So we started our school year with um, close to 40, I believe, vacancies of positions in classrooms. So um, we worked with the district. We have been um, trying to encourage teachers to come and work here. It's been a difficult process. We put our TOSAs in classrooms to help with the vacancies that we have, um, but we continue to have close to two dozen classroom vacancies, which would in fact be a violation of this Williams report. So I just wanna make that on public record. Thank you. All right, any discussion from the board? Right. I'd like to make a motion to accept this Williams report as reported by administration. All right. Have a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Motion carries 403. Item 9.9 .9, approve the appointment of a teacher on a provisional uh, internship permit. Report will be presented by Allison Niazawa, Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. Yes, thank you again, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. We have a provisional intern permit, a PIP for one of our employees, um, Thomas Hinga. He is a special ed teacher at PV High School. Um, he has been with us since the 2021 school year and we'd like to continue with him and we appreciate his service to our students. And so I request that you approve his provisional intern permit tonight. Any public speakers to this item? No. No public speakers. Okay. Um, any discussion from the board? All right. Nine point, this and, is 9.9. 9.9. 9. 9. I'd like to make a motion sorry, to approve. There are public speakers. Oh, I'm 9. sorry. 9. Okay. I missed it. Sorry. Uh, Mariah or Maria. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. <laughs> this is my first time at a board meeting, so I'm not even sure how to read off. I, I obviously think that special ed teacher deserves the pay, um, but I, I think that this is a broader issue that we shouldn't entice the teachers that are here. We should raise the pay scale so that we not just attract other teachers, but we retain them so that they don't need a, a stipend to continue to work here. Um, I think if you raise the pay scale, you wouldn't need to entice with these one-time payments. You wouldn't need to hire subpar teachers that have not yet met the requirements and don't they don't even have a provisional license yet this does such a disservice to students I think our students need experienced teachers not teachers on a permit um, approving teachers on a permit because the ones that live down the street are burnt out or that they would literally rather drive two and a half hours to make a livable wage is like a slap in the face I've met occupational therapists that are here on a travel contract they say oh I know Watsonville they offer a lot to work there and they move from places like North Carolina to become travel therapists and to help out places like this PBSD is nationwide known for and famous for this and it's sad when we could increase the pay scale and could retain and have the people that are teaching here that already live here. Uh, lastly, you guys banned helium balloons because you care for the environment, but if you truly cared, you would raise the rate so that educators that are driving on Highway 1 every day would not contribute to congestion and traffic every single day. So when I see signs like, we will train anyone to work as a bus driver, when I see you guys advertise that you will hire unlicensed teachers and retain them on a provisional license, it feels like a huge slap in the face when we live three minutes away from public schools and PBSD that we could service. My dad wakes up at 5 a.m. every seconds. morning and gets home at 5 p.m. because he wants to make a livable wage as a bus driver and he would dr rather drive to Morgan Hill than PBSD when he lives right here near Safeway. Driving to Morgan Hill and he turns 60 soon. So how long can you continue to do this? You guys received 77 million in COVID relief funding whereas other school districts only got three to four thousand. Uh, sorry, three to four million. So you guys got 77 million. So raise the pay scale so that we can continue to, to say that we live, work, and play in PBSD. Like someone said before me, the schools are hemorrhaging. And this is clearly an emergency provision in which a raise is not just needed but desperately warranted. Thank you. Right. Any discussion from the board? All right. I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to support um, the hiring of Thomas Hinga on a PIP provisional right. status. Can and I have thank him for his decision and his interest in working with kids in the special ed department. 
All right, I've got a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, uh, 502. Item 9.10, approve the memorandum of understanding between PVFT and PBUSD, mm -hmm. increased subbing on the prep rate. Um, report will be presented by Allison Yazella. Yes, thank you, President, Home Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. We have an MOU for you tonight um, that we worked on with PVFT to increase the subbing on prep rate. So in the contract, it's already negotiated that there is an additional rate if teachers either cover a class um, while they're on their release time, their prep time, or even if they assume other students in their class. Um, we worked with PVFT on increasing that rate to help incentivize more teachers to maybe volunteer to do it. It's already part of the contract that we ask for volunteers first. Um, and so we do recognize that there has been an increased amount of time and effort put in by our teachers. And so we want to recognize their hard work and try to incentivize them as well as re um, compensate them more for, for the time that they're spending um, after hours for doing their prepping because they're covering the classes. So um, I request that you please approve this MOU tonight. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. Helmon and Claudia Vargas. Uh, hello, my name is Herman Rafael Gonzalez, community advocate and ASB co-president of Watsonville High School. And I'd like to speak today about the necessary support for our teachers in this and how shortcomings often fall upon our students. Because I want to give you all the students' perspective. I want to listen to them and you know, advocate on their behalf. And doing that includes advocating for teachers. I remember hearing in the first few days upon our return to school about um, schedules that, and seeing schedules that just had blank spaces where a teacher's name would be. And in the first few days, um, students who didn't have substitutes or teachers just being funneled into the new gym without a classroom to be in, without a place to learn. And this was really, really disheartening for me to see, for seeing my peers miss out on the education that they need and the classroom setting that they need, but so many of my peers echoed that sentiment. And I actually spoke to a lot of our uh, long-term substitutes and the new teachers that we have, and I'm very, very, very thankful to have them, uh, especially in our social studies department. I know a lot of people left Watsonville High School social studies department and have been able to come back, and I'm happy that they're there. But. So many of my teachers have had to fill in for uh, substituting positions. My AP Spanish language teacher had to fill in for a math class. My former AP Human Geography teacher had to fill in for a ceramics class. So I say all of this so I can ask you to please, please, please make quick effort as soon as possible to ensure that my peers have a teacher that they can have consistently and have the proper support through substitutes. I'm thanking you for the increase in pay. Uh, I'm not sure if that's what's being voted on or not, but if it is, please, please, please vote on it. If not, uh, if it's already been passed, then I hope you continue to support our teachers and support them even, uh, I hope you support them through increase in payments through when they have to substitute. Thank you. My name is Claudia. I'm a parent to two high school uh, juniors, a community member, and a PVUSC employee. I work directly with students and teachers in the classroom and have worked with some wonderful and qualified teachers just to see them go to other districts or other positions due to the uncompetitive pay the district offers, and our students are negative, negatively impacted directly. I have seen it myself, the significant decline in student education and the negative impact it has in the classroom when a teacher leaves and is left with a revolving door of subs and currently no sub at all. They're in the outdoors, <laughs> you know. Um, administrators and other teachers are missing out on their prep time, pitching in where they can, and they're exhausted. Mm. Um, I'm in support of our teachers and future teachers offering them competitive pay, sign-on bonuses, incentives, and benefits to keep them to keep them and to recruit new teachers to our district's classrooms and give our students the quality education they deserve. And furthermore, competitive pay and benefits shouldn't be such a battle, but a norm for our district and our students. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any discussion from the board? Can I have a motion? Make a motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, 502. All right. 9.11, uh, approved memorandum of understanding between PVUSD and PVFT, classroom teaching position signing bonus. Alex. Yes, me again. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Targus. I have an MOU for you tonight, um, again, that we worked in collaboration with PVFT on to um, expand our our signing bonus to classroom positions. We are finding that all of our teaching positions are hard to fill. The original one that we put through was to address math and science and special ed, and we are finding the same challenges with foreign language, art, bilingual classes, second grade. And so we, we want to be able to put this out there. We want to be able to get people to come to our district. We're, we're heavily recruiting to do so, and this would be a, another tool for us to use to bring people to PVUSD. So I um, request that you approve this MOU tonight. Mm -hmm. All right, do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. Travis Walker. Hi there. I will try to keep it shorter this time because I feel like I said most of what I needed to say last time. But um, obviously I hope you pass this uh, to get more teachers in this district and fill the vacancies. But I also hope that you don't go home and feel like you solve the problem if you do. $2,500 over the span of two years that will, this will be paid out is not enough. And it's only for new teachers. Um, <laughs> if you thought that the amount of teachers that left last year was rough and hard to handle. Let me tell you from the conversations that I've been having this year, wait until next year. I also, since I have extra time, would love to comment on one of my amazing students, Lucia's uh, comments earlier. It was heartbreaking to listen to those comments because all of the things that Lucia was saying were the exact same things that when a student, a queer student I was close to that my first year in the district was saying. It's just another example of how little has changed in this district over my time being here. Issues over the only non-gendered bathroom, before there straight up wasn't a door on it, and now there is a door and it's always locked. I honestly couldn't tell you which one was worse. Um, I hope that you all will take steps to address these things instead of letting them be ongoing issues forever and ever. Thank you. Did Lucia leave? Lucia she was on here. Home. She did? Okay, because she. Hello, once again, my name is Herman Rafael Gonzalez, uh, ASB co-president with Lucia Mackey Martinez, who has been amazing tonight. And uh, I'd like to talk about hoping that you all pass this. I, Of course, I hope you pass this. I, of course, I hope that the vacancies throughout our whole district get filled. I really, 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 really think you will, and I hope you will. But I also hope that you keep in mind the need for and <laughs> further working on uh, retaining these teachers. And I know that this is a really, really, really big priority. But from once again, from a student's perspective, from my peers' perspective, it feels like some of our favorite teachers, teachers that we've gone close to, just come and go all the time. Like I've, I remember being here in my first year in Watsonville freshman, meeting a first year teacher, and then now <laughs> I've been at Watsonville High School longer than I have. And that's, that's really disheartening to see because we do have a strong community at Watsonville th throughout this district and so many of our schools, but it's just not manageable for a lot of them to live here. And that's uh, because of a combination of a lot of problems and like high cost of living here and all these different aspects. But I hope that passing this, you help you help bring in new teachers, and I hope that you really, really focus on retaining these teachers and support our students through supporting our teachers through higher pay, through caring for them, and caring for our students. Thank you. Mm 
All right, do we have any discussion from the board? Okay, uh, Trustee Shocker. I just have a clarifying question here. So all new eligible teachers, new hires. Correct. Being, are these including our math and science teachers? So would they qualify for the 2,500 and then also qualify for the 2,500? It's not compounding. It's an expansion of what's already there. So we already have one for math, science, and special ed. But like we're saying, we're, we're trying to expand that because all of our positions are equally hard to fill. So that one is still in place under the what's the current MOU that we have that's written actually under the contract, but it does have expiring language. So that would still apply. Um, this one is in addition to, and it's trying to really fill our vacancies that we have for this current school year. Okay, so if we're still having problems filling these positions, that's something that can be brought back to extend the bonus for math and science and CELPA? Yeah, we can look at it if that's what we feel we need to do. Just one. Yeah, to yeah, that. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Um, thank, thank you um, for bringing this forward. Was this a negotiated item or are we just offering it? Um, PBST and the district has worked together to bring different solutions to some of the problems. So we brought this to, to them and they brought the subbing one to us. So we're, we're trying to work at mitigating kind of all the things we've been hearing tonight to, mm -hmm. to try to address it as best we can together. So yeah, yeah, we worked with them, of course. So I'm on an association with um, all the different um, school boards in this county and indeed that feeds into um, a, a statewide organization. And so this is a problem all across our state other people have said it but it is like a huge problem it's not a small problem it's a huge problem um, I know a lot of teachers have left this district over the years um, due to many different ideas about things being better in other districts but the truth is is that this district pays the best benefits and retirement um, relative so it, when people leave they go other places and they often see that they don't have great benefits or they have to pay tremendous costs to cover their whole families. Um, so I think we try to do the best we can with what we have and um, I look forward to negotiations um, with PVFT so that, um, so that we can come to some conclusion about um, increasing salaries if possible. So I wanted to say thank you very much for bringing this forward and I hope can, can you just talk a tiny bit about recruitment, about sure. your recruitment efforts that we are under, that we have underway and what's happening? Yeah, we actually are going to, a, um, a lot of stuff has stayed virtual through COVID and it's actually been, there's there's some good byproducts of it, right? Of, of being able to outreach a little bit further than we would sometimes in person. Um, we're working with Ed Week. They're doing, they do four virtual um, recruitment fairs a year, October, uh, January, July, and March, sorry, I skipped March. Um, and we're, we've just partnered with them to get our like virtual booth set up and video so that we can go to the October one in a couple weeks. Um, we're looking into LinkedIn and some other places that are not just educational based because we do hire a lot of employees that are not teachers and not of certificated natures, nurses, occupational therapists, bus driver, like all of those things. And so we're trying to get out to other job boards that where the employees are and meeting them and finding ways that we can actually proactively tap them or headhunt them instead of waiting for them to come to us. So my department is working, my executive assistant's taking it on to help find other means that are gonna be beneficial to us to find the employees instead of waiting for them to come to us. Um, I know that uh, in the like the Bay Area region, I can't, I think it's Oakland or San Francisco, the, the city's actually putting money into the pot for teacher salaries. Do we, have we talked to uh, the county, uh, have we talked to the county about can they, Supplement our budget. And I'm not talking oh. about the COE, but I mean, like, oh, like, like the like county Santa of Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz? Yeah. I haven't explored that. I don't know if that's an option, but we yeah, can. Yeah, I don't reach know. Out. It likely is not an option, but I think we need to explore it just because I've heard that other communities are doing it because of the um, crisis that mm -hmm. they're facing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and you know, I think our number one priority is to get the best teachers that we can yeah. get, and also to retain our quality employees. 100%. So. Anyway, thank you. Yep. I'd like to make a motion to support this. <laughs> I'll second that motion and echo what she said. <laughs> all right, we have a first and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Motion carries, 502. All right, item 9.12, eligibility determination and funding authorization to sign applications and associated documents. Report will be presented by Clint Rucker, CBO. Good evening, President Home, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, this resolution is actually one that you have seen before, but in a slightly different format. Um, we've always, we always bring them forward with uh, the current CBO as one of the allowed signers. What this is is the Office of Public School Construction actually offers up um, different grants, effectively they, just like we have bonds at times, so does the state. The state uses those bonds to look at eligibility requirements across districts and then approve certain uh, projects for new construction or modernization for those districts utilizing state funding. So what this resolution allows us to do is to streamline the process and rather than each time we apply for um, these eligibility for all of our sites, it allows myself and Dr. Rodriguez to sign on behalf of the board to say that yes, we do want to be put into the eligibility pool and trying to get, get as much of this public money as possible. So I would recommend the board approve this resolution as it is one more vehicle for us to try and get more funds for construction. All right, uh, any public speakers to this item? No speakers. All right, any questions or comments from the board? Uh, Trustee Soto? I just have a question, Clint. Do we have any particular projects earmarked for this money, or is this just a general? So every time, something? great question. Every time we do a uh, project, we actually work with school facility consultants, which is one of our vendors who looks at the project and then helps us determine eligibility requirements. Right now, the um, mo MPR modernization that was at Aptos Junior that was that is one of the projects that's being considered. The portables at Duncan that we are doing, we're actually submitting to them um, hopefully next week for that one to be considered. So anytime we do a project, regardless of the funding we use, we always apply for this funding to effectively offset what we're going to spend. So typically it's projects that we're doing, whether it's with ESSER funding or if it's with um, our developer fees, we end up sending these for approval to see if the state will actually reimburse us for the project. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve. We have a first. I'll second. I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 502. Thank you so much. All right. So, um, item 9.13 approval of PVUSD safe return to in person instruction and continuity of services plan. Report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, our superintendent. Yeah, thanks so much. So, as has been stated, um, we have been receiving ESSER funding. Um, so, we received ESSER 1, 2, and 3. Um, now, several months ago, the, um, the state determined that in order for us to be able to receive this funding, we have to have a safer return and safe return to in-person instruction and continuity of services plan. So it's a fairly lengthy plan, so we won't go through um, the entire plan. What you will notice um, as you're looking through it, I know that the board reviews the documents prior, is that you'll notice that it's, it's very similar to something you have seen before. And that is because this is our CCP plan for the majority of it. Um, one of the options that we had, um, which is both in the narrative and within the opening of this document, is that we could use the CCP, um, which we approved prior to March 11th, as the base of the program. And then what we're required to do is every six months, which is meaning we had to do it six months um, from March um, to now. Um, and then we're also required um, from now on every six months to also um, d update this plan and we're assuming that that will happen until the funding ends, which is in 2024. So you will wind up seeing this document and any of its modifications every six months. Um, one thing that you'll see is you'll see some um, minor changes if you look at physical distancing requirements that has been updated. The only thing that was really updated from what was the previous plan, the CCP plan was actually signed by myself um, and the president of PVFT and president of CSEA. Um, in this plan, it wasn't required to have those signatures and so therefore we don't have it. I did provide the draft. Um, most of what you will see is completely the same as at CCP. 
um, you will see some changes to the physical distancing. Another um, change that you will see is it asks us to include the information regarding continuity of services. And so that information has now been included, but you will notice if you look at it that it seems very familiar yet again. And that is because that information is the information that I provided when we did the Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant. So all this information has at one time or the other been approved by the board, um, but this is a logistical requirement um, for us to be able to receive all the ESSER funds, which of course is important to the district and we want to make sure that we can use that. Upon this approval we will place it on our website and we will translate it so that it is available in English and Spanish and then once again um, six months from today or before um, you will again see this document with any modifications um, to it that are happening because of changing circumstances. So I um, ask that you approve um, this document. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we have one. Chris Webb. Uh, I wanted to say I, I appreciate that we've got on-site testing and we've been providing some te some masks to teachers. Um, the night that we had all those belligerent anti-maskers, I, I spoke to a couple in the parking lot who are kind of reasonable. Took away two good points. One being that teachers should be, especially elementary teachers, should be provided masks specifically for students and that sometimes they would direct students to switch masks if their old mask has been soiled. And then the other thing was about like certain masks w were being denigrated. So maybe we should have better masks like um, N95s or KN95s. Uh, I'd rather trade in all of the free cloth ones I have to get one or two of those, those kind. Because the cloth ones, they when I'm teaching, they come down off my nose. It's a hassle. Um, additionally, I think the uh, district could show that they truly care by taking some of these COVID funds and funding COVID leave through the rest of the pandemic and providing rapid testing for any t um, students or teachers in the same class as a COVID positive student and that being in the same class as a COVID positive student should automatically count as a close contact. And um, let's see, uh, also I, I, some students have brought this up. They, they, they feel like having to wait a day while they're at school. With We had a positive case, they had to wait and they felt like they're being, uh, I'd say like exp endangered. Um, the other thing is that I'm gonna be going on family leave, I don't have sick days to spare and as a result i'm not i even though I, the testing is optional for me at this point i'm not going to take any tests i used to take tests but i won't be doing it because i can't afford the sick days and we got the, no COVID leave i think the pvsd could show they care by following the suit of a similar district nearby they do an enhanced family leave one week of paid family leave for each year of service in the district I feel like that'd be a good way to promote um, a safe environment. You'll get me back doing my thing of testing even though I don't have to. And you'll also have a more uh, another tool for recruitment and another way to help keep the teachers you have. Thank you. Mm, that's a good idea. All right, um, any discussion from the board? All right, make a motion to approve. All right, got it a motion. A second. It's a tremendous amount of work that went into this document, so I don't know, Michelle, who, Dr. Rodriguez, who helped you write it. Yeah, I figured. Um, it's a tremendous amount of work, and so thank, thank you. Yeah. All right, we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, 502. Item 9.14, PVSD and Digital Nest Partnership, Internship Program for Signature CTE Pathways, Nest on Campus Clubs. Report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yeah, thanks. Um, so nestled in the program that I, I was just speaking about, um, the Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant funding highlighted five 
key partners that we wanted to continue to expand the opportunities for our students. This is the last and final of the five. Um, so we have now done um, agreements with all five of the partners in which we um, supported. So what this will, and this is a perfect location, so thank you. Um, what this will do is it will provide fun, um, two years of additional support from Digital Nest. So one thing that we're already doing is um, doing a summer internship program. This would actually increase significantly on um, the number. So currently they do have a summer internship program, but it's not directly linked with PVUSD or funded in any way. This would allow us to ensure that 20 incoming seniors and juniors would be able to be part of that program. We've heard from our students that um, it's definitely a desired position to be working in Digital Nest. It would also help to um, link the work that's happening in the summer with the work that is hap or the, the programming that is happening from fall and spring. Um, and allow our students to participate in the various areas within Digital Nest, whether it's Nest Flight or um, Digital Nest um, Youth Workforce. And probably the most most important is number four that you see up there, which is they have and continue to help support our students to get our students in paid entry level positions in local companies and also paid internships um, through um, business and other areas within Digital Nest. And so, um, Julie Edwards, who's in the back, has done a fantastic job on um, supporting our CTE programming. This would be another way to continue to support that programming. And I do want to note that through the work that Julie's been doing, we have not only been able to really capitalize on our CT work, but also capitalize on our partnerships, including the partnership with Digital Nest that now services Pajaro Valley High School Aptos High, Watsonville High, and Renaissance. Um, and so I hope that you approve this, um, which is part of the monies for Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant, which has to be for something over and above what we had already done. Um, and so it cannot be used for um, current staffing, but rather something that we're going to be supporting over and above. And I ask for your approval. All right, any public speakers to this item? No speakers. All right, any discussion from the board? All right, uh, can I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, uh, five zero two. President Holm, I'd like to make a motion to extend the meeting to midnight. All right, I have a first, do I have a second? Second. second. All right. We have first and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 502. All right. So, item 10.1 uh, PVUSD Health and Welfare Benefit Provider Review. Report will be presented by Clint Rucker, CBO, and Mark Lowenthal, our health care consultant. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, a few board meetings ago, and actually multiple board meetings, you have heard public ask about our current benefit plans and if we can do anything to potentially going to self-insured like we used to be or switching to a different provider to save money on benefits. Currently, the district spends almost $50 million on health and welfare benefits, kind of to uh, Trustee DeSerpa's point earlier. We do spend quite a bit on health and welfare. Um, in order to address this, we really wanted to bring someone in who has expertise across the state on benefits and what they look like at districts our size as well as kind of the different pools that would be available. So with us we actually have uh, Mark Lowenthal from School Employees Association of California. To clarify, he does not work for CISC, who we currently actually is our current provider. He is a neutral third party who actually provides the district with benefit um, advice, options on ways to adjust plans or adjust our providers. He really is looking out for a way for the district to be able to save money. He serves on our benefits committee for those of you who have 
have been at our benefits meetings. He does provide us with information, does a lot of research on our behalf. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark so he can kind of discuss the options that we have in front of us in terms of would it be viable or would it be prudent for the district to look at switching providers or potentially going to a self-insured plan. So with that, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, Welcome to Pajaro Valley, Mark. Thank you so much. Sorry you had to sit through that. Sorry what? Ex I'm sorry you had to sit through that exciting meeting. No, it's, uh, um, it, it's good <coughs> to be here. It's, it's actually good to address this with all of you. It's something that actually we have discussed in committee um, over time, uh, actually a few times in terms of this. It, it really is a, a profound question that I think every school district needs to ask. Are we actually purchasing the health care that we have at the best price? It's a very simple and direct question. And I'm pleased to say, not to uh, bury the lead, that in this case you are. Uh, purchasing from CISC is really the best way to purchase health care in the state today. But uh, I wanted, was asked to begin with an introduction, so I think you should know that my background is uh, analytical and actuarial. Uh, prior to working with school districts, I managed an actuarial firm. It was uh, really on the East Coast, uh, concentrating on the private sector, uh, large, large uh, private employees. But uh, since 2001, I've been involved with school districts. My first assignment was in conjunction with the Justice Department in uh, the New Orleans, uh, New Orleans uh, School Parish. Um, and the superintendent from there, ultimately, uh, there I was in charge of a fraud investigation. Um, we returned about $20 million to the school district. Primarily, this was based on health care or health insurance fraud. Uh, but not only that, the superintendent ultimately went to Stockton from New Orleans. You may have known Dr. Amato. Um, and at the time, he, uh, when, when he went to Stockton, he was greeted with a 33% increase in health care. And so he called, and that brought me to the state of California and working with two not-for-profits. Uh, the first not-for-profit, the California Education for Health Care, uh, California Education Coalition for Health Care Reform, was joint labor management. Um, 501c3, uh, a subgroup of the Center for Collaborative Solutions, and the organization I work for now, which is also not-for-profit, the School Employers Association of California, which deals with labor and management issues. Um, and, and the focus of these uh, endeavors was really how to reduce costs and improve outcomes for, uh, for health care for school districts statewide and individual school uh, districts. You should also know that during my tenure, I've been hired by CTA, I've been hired by CSEA, I have been hired by CISC and California Value Trust and CalPERS and VEBA. There's barely an entity that deals with school districts that have not hired me from time to time for specific uh, projects. But I don't accept commissions, never have. I'm not a licensed broker, I'm not a salesperson. Um, so I don't derive any income from making any recommendations. And I've been pleased to work with the district um, for a little over four years in terms of advising the committee, which is also a joint labor and management uh, uh, committee. So um, in terms of the question, can we purchase uh, better or can we do better than CISC, uh, really the question becomes, uh, you know, we think about health care, but uh, health care, sorry, thank you. Uh, health care is not really a purchase so much of health care, but it's a purchase of risk. Someone is designing deciding what is our risk and how much might that cost us in terms of health care. As you may know, health care now has an unlimited risk. It used to be that health plans had lifetime maximums, but with the Affordable Care Act, often called Obamacare, uh, that's been eliminated. Um, just because it's baseball season, but if you'll remember some time ago, uh, there was a San Francisco Giant fan who went to Los Angeles Stadium, Dodger Stadium, and was terribly beaten up. That was a $25 million claim, right? Wow. Um, uh, we have had districts, actually you have a neighboring district that had you know, premature triplets. That, that led to a 26% increase in health care. 
right? Um, there's a district with hemophilia twins, right? This is a million dollars a year for the life of, of these children. Um, and so it has always been our advice that school districts get out of the risk business. The risk business is terribly unpredictable and very, very expensive in what is a for-profit industry. Anytime we purchase insurance, an insurance company earns money, typically around 15% of that risk. And so the less risk we assume, um, the better off we, we are. You're a very large school district, but as a risk pool, you are tiny. Right? Actuarially, we like to see groups of at least 100,000 members. At 100,000 members, we get, we get various aspects of predictability and economy of scale which help us. Uh, you had actually um, been self-funded. It's long before I got here, but before you moved to CISC, you were self-funded. And unfortunately for you, you were underfunded and you were running at a deficit. Uh, you wouldn't be the first district that this happened to. I've actually worked with several and which have reduced, uh, Pajaro, excuse me, not Pajaro, uh, it'll come to me. Anyway, they had eight furlough days to pay for their, for their risk. Um, uh, but at the time, and uh, I'm, again, it predated me, but I was reminded that it was actually brought up to the administration by the certificated group that the service was poor and you did not have access to PAMF or Sutter hospitals. And currently half of your members choose to use those, those providers. Um, so you were in really a, a very challenging situation. Um, but then you went to CISC, uh, which is something that I wasn't involved in, but would, be, would have been a decision that I would have uh, recommended at the time or supported at the time. Oops. So the advantages of the large uh, purchasing pools are pretty much self-evident in many instances because of the economy of scale. So all the administrative fees are less. It's sort of like Costco or Walmart. Things simply cost less in terms of it, but you may not know in terms of pharmaceutical purchasing, uh, larger purchasers get tremendous discounts, often 20 or maybe 25% better than what you would purchase if you were purchasing uh, by yourselves. The most important aspect of it is the predictability. Um, the uh, predictability of the large group, the axiom of large numbers, this is a little perverse, but it lets us know the larger we are, we can tell within really 1% how many of us will get seriously ill, um, how many of us will have um, serious complications. And uh, the larger we are, the more predictable we are, the more predictable we are, we don't need to purchase additional insurance to protect us against catastrophic um, outcomes. And again, as I mentioned, any time we purchase additional insurance, we're paying a for-profit company um, you know, to assume that risk. As they assume that risk, uh, we, we, we pay for it. So, um, uh, CISC, on the other hand, um, is very large, uh, uh, I think 360,000 members at this particular point. Um, they offer multiple plan designs and networks, and that's without adverse selection. Adverse selection is, you know, when we're a small group, we, we offer sometimes a higher plan and a lower plan, while the sicker people go to the higher plan. And those rates then increase faster as their risk improves or their risk increases. Um, and CISC is fully reserved. When you're self-funded, you need to be able to be fully reserved, and CISC is. So in effect, you married wealthy when you joined CISC, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, because it was a, a fully insured group, you no longer needed your reserve. Should you become self-funded yourself, you will need to establish a reserve fund. And those reserve funds are not funds that you can use for other, other things, right? They have to stay as the reserve only for health care. Um, there, oh, sorry. Um, so then the question is uh, of the large pools, is CISC the best, right? If you agree with me that in no school district should be self-funded and you found CISC, well then, well, but is CISC the better, best pool, the best large pool? Um, and really in the state, there are only two 
um, pools that would assume your risk in entirety. Right? There are other pools, but you retain some of your risk. The story of the premature triplets and the 26% increase, that happened in another pool, not CISC, not CalPERS. The two pools in California, we're very fortunate in California to have two alternatives like this. Um, you're protected completely against your own uh, uh, adverse uh, utilization, right? If you all get sick or if everyone here gets sick at one time, our rates don't go up any higher than the whole rest of the, of the, of the statewide school pool that CISCA includes you in. So it's CISC and CalPERS. CalPERS is really the same way. Um, but when we compare the two pools, CISC is far superior and that's for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is, is that in general, school workers are healthier than state workers. Um, primarily because you're younger, right? School districts in general hire more and younger. Um, and the younger you are in healthcare, the less expensive you are. We're four times more expensive when we're 60 than when we're 20 in terms of healthcare. So if you wanted to marry a pool, you'd want to marry wealthy and younger, right? Um, right? Because the healthier you are, the less money you'll pay. Um, also, CalPERS is required, state legislation, and we're actually very pleased about this. I personally have brought numerous districts to CalPERS when they're the right choice for them. Um, CalPERS, as a state agency, is required to accept all school districts, um, all public agencies for that matter. CISC does not. So CISC actually looks at each school district before they let them into the pool, and they reject about half that want to join. That being said, they've had about 80,000 new members over the past four years. Um, and it's primarily because they are the best of these choices. CalPERS permits members to opt out. Um, anytime you permit members to opt out, uh, CIS does not, CIS requires full-time members to stay in the pool. Anytime you permit members to opt out, it's typically the healthier members opt out so they don't have to pay for their health care. Um, but then when they get sick, they come back in. So it's, it's a significant disadvantage. And the result of that is that, um, oh, I'll keep going here, but, but, just, but you know, is that CIS actually for the same level of plan is 15% less than CalPERS. So um, if you ever had a choice or a question, should CalPERS be preferred over CISC? And I would suggest to you there is no third option. Any third option would mean you would be accepting your own risk. Um, and that's, that's really problematic for school districts. It's very hard for you to raise money to, uh, to pay for sick employees or for, uh, for sick dependents. Um, but here's just some other things. Um, CalPERS offers only two uh, levels of coverage for pre, uh, PPO um, plans. You're primarily a PPO district. CISC offers uh, many. Um, as I mentioned, when we do an actuarial evaluation of the plans that would be most similar, again, it's, it's not really, it's significantly less of a benefit than what you currently offer. But when we equate the two, CISC is 15% better. Um, also, CISC provides you numerous additional uh, value, added value plans, employee assistance program, telemedicine, expert medical second opinions, virtual physical therapy, chronic care management, wellness, and lifestyle coaching. That's all included in your premium. If you wanted to replace those, um, you obviously would be paying for those. Um, so, um, and for the past seven years, CISC has averaged about a 3.8% increase, which is actually better than the statewide average. And in the past two years, it's been less than 2%. We've actually, we meaning school districts in general, have actually been very, very fortunate in terms of our COVID experience compared to the state and compared to the nation. In general, school districts have done better um, in terms of not having many terribly sick people um, with COVID. And as a result, again, if you were gonna pick a pool to be in, you'd wanna pick one particularly during this pandemic, wealthier, younger and, and a group that is not so subject to uh, the terrible uh, aspects of the pandemic. So uh, I think that's really all I had.
Okay. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> so. All right. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, Chris Webb. Well, that's good to hear we have such a good plan. Um, I, I was concerned that we might re bring up some old bad ideas like capping or, or cutting our health care benefits, which um, just before anybody possibly thinks of this, uh, I just wanted to note like what a terrible this idea this would be, especially given um, the pandemic and the lack of teachers. So if you took away the benefits, some of our uh, teachers who've been here the longest would have less incentive to stay. Um, so I wanted to just make sure we, we got that out in the air and um, that we, we didn't do anything to make teachers not want to stay. Um, I think we need to, do, we need to, I just want to reiterate again how we need to add the COLA and um, to, to the teacher salary schedules and that when we didn't all allocate the COLA to the salary schedules, uh, it seems kind of like a misuse of those funds. And then, and even more so with the SRO thing, if that's how you're gonna fund SROs. So I just wanna bring those, those two points up. For the person the, from the public who was like the spearhead behind this, I appreciate the appeal to transparency and efficiency. And I would suggest my own efficiency uh, measure for or transparency of, Transparency of budget, and that would be at the site level. I'd like to see an administrative regulation um, require site administrators to present their site budgets to their their leadership teams or their staff at large, so we can make sure that uh, resources at the site level are being used efficiently, efficiently and equitably. Thank you. Anyone else? Yep. All right. Any questions or comments from the board? Trustee DeSerpa? Thank you. This is a great conversation. Thank you for being here so late tonight. Um, so I heard what you said about CISC, so I'm glad we're in it. I didn't realize that they turn other school districts down. That was news to me. Um, so I feel grateful that we are in. Um, could they at any time decide that our risk, no, once we're in, we're in. Okay, great. Um, but so one of the things I want to talk about is the way that we structure all of the benefits. We have PPOs, I think not just one, multiple. We have HMOs, we have EPOs. There's, we have different products to choose from within the CISC program. That's correct. And that is where it's costing this district tremendous amounts of money. So for example, I have worked in healthcare all of my career, just about. And years ago, years ago, um, they have moved us to where you can have a PPO, but if you want that, you will have to pay extra. And if you want the free plan, you'll have to stay with a managed care plan in HMO. So my family, because we couldn't afford anything else, we always chose the HMO. In this district, we're not asking people to choose an HMO. We are essentially, that's a negotiated item with the union, but it would save us tremendous amounts of money if we moved to a model like that, and then we could essentially give that money in salary, you know, salary instead. So I, I'm wondering, do you have any recommendations about that or moving to a Kaiser plan or anything that's so much more affordable? The district does offer a Kaiser plan. The right. district does offer a health savings account qualified plan that's a high deductible PPO. The district does offer two HMOs. And actually the district incents members, they provide a financial incentive for members who decide to choose those. Um, you know, to your point about offering different plans or, uh, you know, we actually offer at this particular point at least one of the kinds of plans that you have mentioned that CISC offers. Um, and, and frankly, newer uh, teachers in general or newer employees, not just teachers, have been opting for the plans where there are incentives, right? And the f incentives are financial. You've negotiated that. Um, in terms of what those incentives should be. Um, in, in the committee, we have discussed uh, numerous other alternatives within the CISC 
um, menu, I guess is the way to say that, and we have discussed how much less money that would cost, and I, I think we continue to do that within your committee. Um, I would say relative not to that, I'm changing the subject a little bit, but there are new federal dollars available to individuals, which we'll also discuss in the committee um, for members who are part-time through the California Exchange, which are something that I think the committee will be pleased to, uh, to, to deal with, and you probably want to hear about it at some particular point. Um, right now, you are uh, outliers in the state in terms of offering um, the level of benefit that you offer to part-time employees and to uh, seasonal employees. That makes you uh, unique, right? I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying that makes you slightly different than other school districts. Um, and so there are avenues uh, within the CISC offerings to find less expensive plans. But again, these are things that we have been discussing in committee for some time now and uh, continue to do so. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, Trustee Shocker. Just to clarify, Clint, these plans are negotiated through CSEA and PVFT along with the district, right? So the plans that are up for choices are negotiated items. Absolutely. So again, we have two different, we're talking about two different things here. One is the pool that we're in, which is CISC, which I think Mark did a good job of explaining is our best option. And as the public brought up, are we doing what's best in terms of where we buy our benefits from? Yes, we are buying them from the best source. Now, are we buying the best plans to save money and to be able to most of, most of find the most affordable plans? That is negotiated. So that's with CSEA and PVFT, we talk about different plans. As Mark noted in the Benefits Committee, we talk about what options could be brought to the table for negotiations, what um, plan changes could we make, what kind of savings would that look like to the district overall, and what could we do with those savings. That piece is all negotiated. Thank you for that question. Of course. And I, I wanted to echo um, Trustee DeSerpa's uh, expression of, of gratitude for sitting, you know, through a, a, a long meeting and for, for coming out to, you know, explain some of these. It's, um, you know, it's, I, I've mentioned, you know, on another occasion, it's like I'm in a doctoral program right now and dealing with statistics classes, and it's like, the bigger the pool, the less, you know, individual risks. So it's like it, it, it makes sense to me. Um, and I think that's it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Pleasure. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you all. <laughs> all right. We will move on to item 10.2, um, Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance Prevention on the 2020-2021 California Healthy Kids Survey. The report will be presented by Sophia Ramirez and Tiffany Brilland. Good night, everybody. Um, thank you guys for having us here. Um, I'm gonna read some of my information just because my brain stopped functioning um, 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so my name is Sofia Ramirez and I'm the new TUPI coordinator. TUPI stands for Tobacco Use Prevention Education. And um, my colleague here is Tiffany and she's a program manager at PVPSA. Um, our presentation today is the California Healthy Kids Survey of 2020-2021. Um, we do this survey every other year. Oh, let me use this. And our presentation will go as followed. First, we're gonna talk about what is the California Healthy Kids Survey, what is our role in PVPSA, and the great implementation modules, and then we will compare our data to the data of the previous um, survey. So the survey is frequently cited by state policymakers and media as a critical, critical component of school improvement efforts to help guide the development of more effective health prevention and youth development programs. With the California Healthy Kids, schools, districts, counties, and the state have a standard tool that promotes the collection of uniform data within and across local education agencies. They are also comparable to existing state and national surveys results. Our role at PVPSA, we are lead and 
um, implementing the survey or administrating the survey to the schools at PBUSD under the 2P program. And we are also uh, take lead on writing and submitting grants that fund the implementation of the survey. The California Healthy Kids data is used to assess the process local control accountability plan and area of the goal number six for Pajar, Pajar Valley Unified School District, which promotes a safe, supportive, and positive school environment that encourages positive behavior, increases students' sense of connectedness. PBPSA acts a acts as a liaison between WestEd and the school district to obtain reports. WestEd is who provides the reports. And great implementation, California Healthy Kids targets major transitional years for students. Fifth grade and seventh grade are natural baseline, baselines for comparison with, within teenage populations. Sixth grade is typically the first year of high school and there is a high prevalence of alcohol or drugs. 11th grade was elected because research shows that students who initiate alcohol or drug use in secondary school have done so by the end of 11th grade. Um, the California Healthy Kids, on another note, is also implemented in fifth grade. However, this for this reporting period, we don't have data for fifth grade. And in the question section, I can explain a little more on that. Um, for secondary school modules, we have first core module, second alcohol and other drugs, thirdly drug-free communities, and fourth social emotional modules and Tiffany will show the numbers now. Thank you. All right. Good evening, everyone. I am a program manager um, for a few of our youth prevention programs with PVPSA. Uh, so I'll just go through a few numbers with you. Um, bear with me. <laughs> Simplify it. But here you see a few uh, numbers. These are final numbers for the su student survey sample size, and it's by grade. Now we're comparing 2018-19 period with the 2020-21 period as well. Um, you can see NT, that's non-traditional students. So these are, this is including continuation, community day, or other alternative school types. So we see in the previous period, the highest response rates um, for the student surveys is 85%. And for the 2020-2021 period is about 62%. And for the lowest rate, lowest response rate um, is 44% for the previous period and for the current is 38%. Um, so across the school grades, you can see that it's a lower response rate in this recent um, reporting period, um, aside from 11th grade having a higher response rate. Right. So just to go through school engagement and supports module, this includes results about school connectedness. So the results here show that fewer students who agree or strongly agree uh, to feeling connected in school grades across grades seventh, ninth, and eleventh. Um, you can see that there is a decrease. There's a slight decrease here, and the variation is about two to nine percent. A question that's also asked is about caring adults in schools. So there's about an average of about 63% of students across all school grades that feel that there are teachers or other adults on campus who care about them. Um, so comparing that with the previous period, that's showing about a 9% increase looking at all grades. But just looking at 7th, 9th, and 11th, you also see an increase as well, about 2%. All right, so now here we have results showing school safety. So it shows an increase in students feeling very safe or safe at schools across most grades, aside from 11th grade students, showing a decrease from 63% to 50%. So that's about a 13% variation. So generally, all other grades remained at a similar percentage. Uh, with about a 2 to 10 percent increase variation. Mm -hmm. 
Moving on to social emotional health module. There's specific mental health questions that are asked um, of secondary students. So this bar graph represents the percentage of responders who reported experiencing chronic sadness and hopelessness. And this is within the past 12 months. So results show an increase in sad and hopelessness feelings among students across all grade, grades you can see here. So the highest variation being 30% and the lowest being about 13%. Okay, so moving on to alcohol and other drug use for a lifetime period. Alcohol use was reduced across the board. However, there is um, an increase with non among non-traditional students from about 27% to 41% with the current period. So that's about a 14% variation. And looking at perceived harm, for the perceived harm of alcohol use, fewer students reported none, so stating that there's no risk of harm for alcohol use of five or more drinks once or twice a week in this current survey period. So this shows that more students in this current period believe that there's some form of harm associated with alcohol use of five drinks or more once or twice a week. And then looking at marijuana or cannabis use, we see that there's a, a decline across all grades um, with about a variation of four to 12%. Okay, so a question was asked regarding tobacco use. This included if students ever use electronic cigarettes or vape products. So here we see e-cigarette use mostly decreased with a variation of seven to 10%. Um, there is an increase among non-traditional students um, from 17% to 27% in this current period. And it decreased across all other grades. In the current period, students' perception of harm from smoking occasionally was reflected as the same or slightly more harmful compared to occasional use of electronic uh, electronic cigarettes. All right. So that ends it there. Any questions or comments? Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, Chris Webb. Um, I want to just speak to where your biggest changes are, which are at non-traditional schools like Renaissance. And I probably, I feel like also this, these changes would be even bigger if it was, the baseline wasn't 1819, but it was 1718, because 1819, we got our, we had a new administrator. You may recall removing him partway through his tenure, but he was hostile to our um, student progress monitoring system. I remember coming from leave, we had to, I came back from leave and, and there I could smell marijuana on a kid who was holding it for somebody else. And eventually um, our office manager is telling people, had to make an announcement like, yeah, actually drugs are not okay at school. And I feel like um, back when we had our system fully functioning, we would have lower numbers. Now that we've, we've gone, taken it away, um, we have these increases. I'm seeing a lot of vaping at school. Um, I'm seeing kind of we're normalizing this because we've allowed, we used to have more of a dress code. Now it's not only like our unaffiliated group or unauthorized group type stuff not enforced, but we aren't really enforcing like stuff promoting drugs. Um, I've seen multiple marijuana related shirts. I've seen alcohol related shirts I normally do not see. And I feel like this um, de-emphasis on this is like manifest right as soon as you look in the, the front door. The sticker, there's the only anti-vaping sticker, bottom corner of the whole door. And that's like about the only anti-vaping message there is in, in the whole school, unless a teacher takes it upon themselves. And if you do take it upon yourself, then you may be compromising your relationship with the students because you may not feel supported um, by the larger system. Um, I think if we wanted to bring police, the only way it would even be a little bit acceptable if it was the right dogs. Because can't smell pills, can't smell vape. It's like a hidden thing. 
Are there any other public speakers? No. All right. Any questions or comments from the board? Okay, Vice President Schaffer. Thanks. Thank you for staying and presenting to us tonight. Um, it's kind of sad to see when we look at the mental health aspect of this past survey and how dramatically that's changed. Um, can you give us a little bit of insight about some solutions that we can help students with? Mm -hmm. Sure, definitely. Um, yeah, so we do connect with uh, different school staff, um, and we do try to promote our different um, programs that we have uh, for youth. Um, we are reaching out to um, different school staff different within the district to see if we can have our prevention classroom presentations and activities um, scheduled, um, and also offering our intervention services or one-on-one -on -one small groups. Um, this is prevention education around tobacco use, also including um, um, cannabis as well, it can be modified alcohol and also um, skill building activities um, or our life skills curriculum as well. Um, so really um, going out to the different schools and having it on a wide scale as well and then additional needs going down to individual or group base. Are you getting enough response about going into the classrooms? And yes, uh, yeah, as of recently, we got quite a bit referrals. Um, so yeah, we are scheduling quite a bit, um, which is good to see. But. Yeah, um, maybe another thing, um, how we can improve together um, is maybe making teachers aware because we have reached mm -hmm. out to some principals and some, some of them don't even know what we are all about. Um, so maybe working together, you know, to promote our program a little bit more in schools so that principals are aware of what is it that we do when we send emails, you know, that would be great and helpful. Thank you so much. Trustee Orozco? Yeah, my comment was going to be in regards to uh, mental health as well. It's really saddening to see that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really unfortunate that um, our kids are having a hard time accessing the services as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know what we can do as a district to ensure that the turnaround time for those services is improved. Um, and that's something that hopefully uh, we'll work together through our wellness centers. Yeah, I was going to say this um, This entire next presentation is going to hit on this. Um, they're speaking primarily about the two-pay program, not the social-emotional supports. Um, and so I just want to clarify yeah. that because our yeah. principals, we have over 200 um, referrals out there that are unanswered at this point. So it's not mm -hmm. that we're not referring our students to PVPSA. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, that will, the next presentation will speak um, completely to the, the questions that you're asking. Thank well. you. Yeah, sorry about the misunderstanding. Yeah, we were talking about more of like tobacco use prevention education. Yeah. Um, I was just curious with the, the drop in respondents for um, your ninth and seventh graders, is it just fewer students responding or is it because we have lower numbers of students at those grade levels? So remember, this was done during COVID. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. was when students were not in person. Yep. And so when we have students that are physically in front of us, it's much easier to ensure that they're um, following up and doing the surveys. This survey was technically done while we were, um, while we were in distance learning. And so I'm sure that the next time that we take it, um, it will be back up. Okay, yes. great. And also, I wanted to echo the appreciation for staying. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys for inviting us. Yeah. We'll tell, we'll tell Erica we stayed there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Good you. night, everybody. All right. So we'll go on to item 10.3, MTSS and anti-bullying updates. Uh, the report will be presented by Kristen Schaus, our Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Education, and Casey Koppenbach, our Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Education. 
Good evening, um, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, Mrs. Schaus and I will be presenting an update on our MTSS and anti-bullying efforts um, this evening. And so um, PVUSD has definitely um, refocused our MTSS efforts on our restorative start and transitioning our students, our staff, and our families back to in-person, right? And so um, we have our graphics right there. On the right, we have our graphic that represents um, PVUSD's graphic for MTSS. Um, and you will notice that we have the academics, the behavior, and the social emotional that come together and work um, to support our students. And you see that first tier um, at the bottom that, oops, that is, our first tier, um, which is the core instructional piece for all of our students. That second, that yellow piece um, right there is for some and for, uh, for strategic. And again, the intensive for a few of the students that are not just responding to the core and the str strategic supports. As you look at the left graphic, I like this one because uh, of course it talks about that universal support. What, what are we giving all of our students? students. And so we um, thought ahead and we were proactive in looking at what do all of our students need as they're returning to in-person in instruction, which they're going to need more than what they would normally be, right? And so if you're looking at MTSS, you're thinking of all these different parts, right, with um, when they're by themselves, they don't have that framework. So MTSS is not an initiative. I, I keep hearing sometimes you're going to hear that it's an initiative. It's not an initiative. It's actually a framework for the work that we're doing. And so it's kind of like this framework right here of the bicycle with all the parts. So you see that school leadership piece with the, with the spoke and the wheel coming together, the implementation, effective interventions over here, that data piece and problem solving approach approach, the coaching that occurs to keep that, that, that improvement going, and with that feedback and the school team working together. And you see that holding all the pieces together, and that's actually, it's a framework, right? And so as we were looking at, at um, what we needed to do to support our schools, it's preparing for the return increase in resources and staff. And we have been continuing to work on our two additional IAs to support TK1, um, additional social emotional counselors at all of our sites, additional interventionists, mental health clinicians at the secondary sites, um, inter, um, additional intercession opportunities, extended learning opportunities, and credit recovery. And this will be continuous, so it's not just one and done, it's gonna be reoccurring um, and, and um, flexible. So as you know, these are some of the highlights from our restorative start. Um, we have professional development ongoing for our staff and tying in our families too, right? And, and that happened right when school was starting. We wanted them to be included, to know what it looked like and sounded like. Um, also, we have focused lessons on identity, belonging, and agency, making sure that our students feel like um, they belong at school, that they are proud of their identity and what they bring with their assets already, and then being able to advocate for their own learning with agency. And we've also implemented a Sown to Grow SEL platform, which allows our students to not only identify their feelings, but set goals for themselves. It also allows us to um, respond and see how our students are feeling as a, as a formative way, so we can actually respond and step in if students need support. And then, of course, that restorative start and focus also aligns with our academic um, curriculum maps, prioritizing certain standards that are key and the most important to get our students back on those on working on grade level, right? And so that's really important too because it's not just the SEL, it's the SEL behavioral and the academic piece too. 
And so as you're seeing that as with our PVUSD CARES, that connection piece is where we started from the beginning and we continue. So we know that connection is all about those routines, bringing them, our students back to what does it look like to be back on school and having those connections with their teachers and other educators on site. So as you can see that routine, um, different ways to greet students every day. So we know that one of the most important things is to greet our students every single day. And so students get to choose the morning greeting and maybe even identify how they're feeling. Um, we also have community building those proactive circles. So we're building communities back in the classroom and also throughout the school and grade levels because that does take time, even with our adults too, right? And so in the middle here, this is actually another ritual or a routine and it's just a quick um, way to settle disagreements and you're gonna see two students really quickly um, on the video. And so that was really quick, right? I wasn't telling a story. So it's so they were actually playing a game and they couldn't decide who got out, right? First, so instead of arguing and wasting people's time or wasting each other's time, they did a quick Rochambeau and teaching that routine and that ritual becomes part of the culture at that school to settle, um, oops. And while he's putting that back up, I just want to say I was at um, I was at Bradley Elementary, and one of the fourth grade students ran up to the principal and said, "I solved a problem today all by myself. I did Rochambeau just like you told me to do." <laughs> and so um, students are are using it and are proud. <laughs> All right, so community building, again, I cannot speak any more about this. It's so important, and we even were doing it with our adults and our leaders, making sure that we're building that trust, right, and building that back up in person. And so I'm going to hand it off. Thank you, sir. Uh, these may look very familiar. In fact, I'm positive that they will look familiar to you. So when we launched in Restorative Start, these are pieces that actually went out to our students, to the graphics and the pictorial kind of journey here. You'll see to the right-hand side, students actually had the opportunity to be able to show their identity and the pieces that are most relevant to them as they were coming back to school. In addition, since Casey has videos, I had to add a video as well. Um, ours is gonna go to middle school, so here is actually what it looked like in a middle school to run through one of the lessons. And we will not watch the whole thing, but it will not be as quick as his either. Today, we're gonna be doing lesson three of our restorative start lessons, and then you guys are gonna be journaling after. Right? Today, we're gonna be talking about, class, what are we talking about today? Brain. This is really interesting because it's important for you guys to learn that as we get older, your brain does start to change. And your brain can actually change when you do certain things. Also, when you create habits, and we're going to learn about that, like creating habits of being organized. What else? Uh, safe. Being safe. What else? Academic. Being academic, being respectful. We can actually start to rewire how our brain and how we do things. So we're going to go ahead and have you pause brain. there so we can give you a little are? glimpse as to what was going on within our middle schools as well and how we are approaching it more so at, at the age appropriateness for our middle schoolers in terms of identifying the changes that are also happening for them. In addition, uh, many of you also were able to join us at the family evening. So during the family evening, we were able to engage parents in the restorative start process. And some of those things looked at the same pieces that, that you were seeing with your kids and actually al allowing you to be able to ask questions at home as well. Um, it was actually a great, well-turned-out event with several parents asking questions within the chat and kids joining their parents and answering questions within the chat. So again, ability to be able to pull in our parents and the community as well to be a part of the process of restoration for our students as well as us. So in to go, Casey actually did a fabulous intro to this. So just to give you a, a few um, icon pieces or data points you can take a look up here to the left hand side um, the graphic first of all is, is 3.8 so that's on a scale of 5 so what Sona Gray does is it's more fluent so similar to what you hear in data where we have Youth Truth when we have the two pay grants when we have California Healthy Survey those are really summative because they're over a longer amount of time Sona Gray is quicker so what it allows us to do is have both effects we do get the summative data 
data from other pieces. This is giving us live time as to how our kids are currently doing based on the responses that they're having. So within our school district, we have about 3.8 um, in the happy scale in terms of what that looks like. It also allows us to do that piece up there at the top, which is really referencing the opportunity for kids to be able to put how they're feeling on that scale in a very easy way and be able to drop a narrative um, in there if they would like to share more. Below that, it actually allows us to disaggregate the data by site to see what may be happening on a site so we can put in some additional services or start having conversations with uh, staff, administration, and really empowering folks to look at why that may be occurring give you an idea of how many folks are using that at this point. So we've had just over 6,500 students already engaged in the program. Over 15,000 reflections have been written since we have started back in school. Um, teacher feedback is just under that 6,000 mark, so we are moving in the right direction. Anticipated growth of what would happen is we're moving into um, a new program and using it. And I will pass this back to my coworker. All right, and so we know part of accelerating um, learning for our students is best first instruction and making sure that our students have access to core instruction, right? Grade level standard instruction. And so with that said, is also making sure that our students are having that opportunity to interact with complex text and problems. And all students, the goal is for them to be doing a majority of the thinking, reading, writing um, and speaking piece of it. And then that focus on equity of voice, making sure that our students are having the, the, uh, the, the opportunities to actually um, share their thinking. And so you have some highlights from multiple schools where you have um, Mr. B over at Starlight who has done a really great job at building um, review and routines and teaching his students how to be independent so so he can teach them and make sure they have access to grade level standards. And then we have a teacher at Ohlone who is, you see the teacher, the students have the microphones, right? They're the ones with the voices that are sharing their thinking and are empowered. And so you see some of our Bradley Bears over here that are utilizing core math um, play stations where they're actually practicing the mathematical um, pieces that they need to be with one another and they're empowered to do that. And so we have noticed that our youngest students really need that help with their foundational skills and that focus. So you already see some kindergartners over at Starlight. They're already getting introduced to SIPs and they are actually are ready for it. Um, you also see some of our kindergartners with SIPs down here at Hyde. And again, getting that foundational skills over at Bradley throughout our district. Um, and then again, you see one of our fantastic teachers teachers over here in kindergarten. Not only is she teaching the core curriculum over here with the story and complex text, she's having them, the students use their foundational skills and their, and their phonological awareness skills to pull apart words and help with the writing piece of it when they're talking about the retail. And so as we're looking at putting those systems, you saw the data piece, right? So during this, we have been able to implement, we gave our first universal screening this last fall using Dibbles and Edel for um, Spanish. And so it actually tells us how the health of um, our reading is and where we need to focus our resources and attention. Um, and so part of that is holding um, data review team meetings and helping make sure our students um, get the right interview interventions or the supports within the classroom. And this is where that coaching, you saw that coaching piece on the bicycle. We had our um, core consultant, Ann Leonigan, come out and coach our teachers along about how, uh, what to really focus on when our students are back here from being out of um, in-person instruction. And so we, we came out with some, with some findings and it helped focus our efforts with our teachers to that continued coaching piece. 
And so also we are blessed here in PVUSD because we have our outdoor learning environments which also add that enrichment piece for our students. We have our sensory pass uh, um, and you can see the students using them there. The outside learning that continues and even the peer-to-peer -peer structured language um, practice strategies even the first week of school. Um, and then this last one right here is our, our Playworks um, pilot that we had at six of our elementary schools that are helping us structure um, our learning environments outside to optimize that time in helping our students be feel included and solve um, disputes out there um, on the playground. So here is a quick clip and it's just as quick as the other one, I promise. So as you can see, that's Ann Soldo, one of our schools. So our students have been taught some structured games and the campus will learn the same games so they will know how to play them outside at recess and lunchtime. And it's part of um, that work with Playworks. Um, I'm gonna pass it on. There you go. We did not have a silent year for PBIS, and I am not working currently. Uh, that may or may not be me in the chicken costume in the center there. Um, however, that is an opportunity also for us to have um, really a gathering of staff that all believe in, in the core piece of what we're doing with connection and PBIS. To the left-hand side, huge kudos to all of the staff that remained invested in PBIS over COVID. It was very difficult to get applications in as our entire world kind of flipped upside down. So quality Qualifiers there, we are number eight uh, across the state of California with 25 of our schools being recognized last year for their work in PBIS. To the right hand side, just uh, some additional pieces that you may or may not be aware of. We did successfully launch our Synergy module and it went live, which means the access to data points for our PBIS team has also increased. So that looks at locations, it looks at where things are happening, and it also looks at what type of events may be happening and what have we tried to help solve those pieces pieces in addition to. A couple of pieces you see, and these are many of the things that Casey already spoke to. This is really about bringing kids back and looking at the expectations line. So during COVID, we did have the opportunity to increase our signage, which welcomed our students back directly on campus with what those expectations were to be Hawks. They weren't the only ones that did that. Several of our schools had that opportunity during the break. Um, in addition to the two review and one new, so going back to are we setting the expectations and bringing our kids into those routines so they know what we're expecting from them. We will not be playing that video. PBIS in secondary looked a little bit differently, but you can also see the welcome back from Watsonville High up in the top corner for their kids. Large roar from all of the folks that are involved in PBIS currently within their campus. You also have EA Hall in the center there, which are kids lining up to take advantage of their redemption for five star points, which is a point system that allows kids to earn points uh, for positive behaviors. You'll also see a couple of other activities uh, Dr. Mansfield at Aptos Jr. ran several assemblies uh, with his assistant principal in regards to um, you're really resetting those expectations and those behaviors and rewarding positive uh, behavior. The top, you'll see our Eagles up there who have already started with the students of the month and making sure that they're demonstrating their core values. In this case, this one was about perseverance some systems that are supporting this work so that we're getting more feedback and understanding as to what our next steps are. Five star students, you've heard a lot about it. Just a refresher to give you an idea. Two of those pieces at the bottom there, this is just one small data point that we have within it, but what it will tell you at the very bottom is how many students have already been recognized on that campus and how many have not, and the frequency by which. It also allows you to dig further. So you can dig by gender, you can dig by ethnicity, you can dig by several other factors to say who are we recognizing and who are we not representing in our rewards. 
to the right-hand side, and Dr. Rodriguez spoke to this as well a little bit earlier. NowPel is actually a, a new system that we have already begun the work in, but it actually allows us to work with partner groups. PVPS, PVPSA is one of those partner groups we are currently working with. It allows us to look at what the referral systems are that are coming in on many different areas, and allow us to also track and manage whether those cases have been closed, what the frequency of those services looks like, and match families in really a one-stop piece that allows us to all communicate more efficiently with each other versus emails or paper referrals that have been happening in the past. Stop it. You've also heard uh, several pieces about. You have uh, a couple of highlights here, and I'll go to really the impact that you've already had by agreeing to allow us to kind of go into this position with Stop It. Um, to the right-hand side, these are a couple of major uh, pieces that, that have occurred. Uh, the fluency of our kids talking back and forth with us, with us has absolutely increased, including our parents. So we have parents that also reach out to us in this fashion and are always re surprised when they're getting a response back generally within minutes of what's occurring. Um, we were able effectively, even within COVID, to be able to really side rail some suicide attempts. This is one of them that's actually presented. A student that actually reported another student, and we were able to get a mobile crisis unit out there immediately. Um, and life-saving by, by all means in that case. A couple of other pieces with a friend that was engaged in self-harm and then also potential fights. We do have students also anonymously telling us those pieces too. In this case, we were able to actually avoid that fight as a result of staff being able to move into position and have a conflict resolution with the students instead. And then you did hear earlier, so we appreciate it. The LGBTQ books that we were actually looking at bringing in to reinforce the identity and belonging within our sites, they were on back order, so several of them were on back order during COVID. They actually came in about four weeks ago. They actually are in the hands of our librarians already and on sites. So a huge win in terms of making sure that our kids actually see reflections of themselves within libraries as well. And then to the left, we've also started a parent piece I was coming out of student services. Um, coordinator of student services, Greg Fry and myself, have been drafting these pieces to help communicate to families the things that we already know to be happening nationally and regionally. So a lot of social media, TikTok presence has been out there actually doing the reverse of what we're trying to do, which is the idea that we're trying to bring them into a welcoming environment and have expectations that are supportive of the learning environment in themselves. In this case, we have challenges that they don't even necessarily know that they're getting involved in that don't just have school consequences, many of them have legal consequences. So engaging parents and knowing that these things are out there, drawing attention to those social media pieces, and then also making them aware of having those conversations at home mitigates a lot of the pieces that we could potentially see as well. And with that, we'll open it for questions. Do we have any public speakers? Yes, we do. Chris Webb, you're up. Um, on the whole, I think there's value to restorative practices in PBIS. The issue for me is that these ideological frameworks were cast as a replacement for our model continuation award-winning system, and they simply are not. Also, this, these, these were done to us, not, not with us as a site, and on their own metrics, our old system does better. Um, these can be complements and they could, they could help us do what we were doing even better. But now that we've thrown out our own system in service to the DO, um, our, uh, we got numerous predictable issues. Students who desperately need structure after a year of distance learning, they're slipping on numerous fronts. Attendance, drug use, respect to staff, academic performance. From the restorative practice training I've had here, um, I'm, I'm realizing that, yeah, our old system was restorative. And this new system is permissive and one of the main reasons is the expectations are greatly reduced. If the district uh, wants to turn us in, if that's what the goal is, like you, you want to move us to a community day school or something, fine, but, the, but let's say that. Um, also, as far as the awards, PBIS, uh, you know, we had our award too. For some reason, it doesn't get any recognition. But I'll, I'll just say this, that our award, um, when we had that award, nobody died at our school. Without our old system, our veterans are feeling dejected as their relationships with students are undermined. We're having to waste time recreate, to recreate that front wheel 
for it to be effective. We don't have the effective tools anymore. Um, suspensions seem to be going up because that's uh, eventually administrators are forced to take some kind of consequence. Uh, they when they they otherwise our old system would have spotted things and corrected them sooner. In the normal situation, I would have had numerous parent meetings by now. I, I've had barely any. I've got students asking me about bringing the old system back because they the kids who aren't coming out of time? know that they it did help them to want to attend and do better. Any discussion from the board? Um, so I just want to say thank you for the Stop It app. I know that you have been making sure that all the schools are aware of that and getting students aware of it. I think it's going to make a huge difference um, for a lot of students. I also really appreciate the piece that you guys are doing on social media. Um, you know, social media is the bane of our existence sometimes. <laughs> and um, really just finding out, you know, um, Parents don't know all these things that are going on. In as much as they try, they don't know the challenges, all the different social media uh, platforms that are out there. So I think it's really important to educate um, their parents. And also, it's important to let kids know that we know what's going on. Um, and we're watching, and we're expecting better from them. Um, expectations speak volumes, I think. and. Having higher expectations of our students make them want to meet us there and, and make their teachers and their families proud. So I think that um, this is the way to do it, is incorporating um, these different measures and making sure that our sites are properly utilizing them to really make an effective difference. And I liked your short videos. <laughs> Thank you. All right, any other questions or comments? I do, I have uh, mm -hmm. one. You know, the, the, um, I attended the restorative start um, initial presentation for parents, and I attended the Spanish version, and it was just really interesting to see how engaged parents were and the very um, good questions they were asking um, and the suggestions that they were offering. And so I feel like we need more of that. Um, because after that initial um, presentation, um, I feel that, at least me as a parent, I speak personally, um, I, I haven't really heard much more about what's going on at my school with my son. You know, how it, these awesome things are happening in the classroom. So I feel like there's still that... Uh, uh, missing piece where we need to further engage parents or keep them connected to, to really what's going on and, and make them participate, not make them participate, but encourage them to participate, have that option uh, that's uh, accessible to them. Um, I like the fact that you're uh, doing the increased um, partnering with families through the new letter series, uh, but with just so much uh, information that we're constantly getting, um, I just want to make sure that doesn't get inundated and all of that. Uh, because we are receiving lots of texts, lots of communications, right? And um, I don't know if there's another way to approach it. Um, and, and that's just at least my, my personal experience. I read all of those, but um, I'm not sure that all our parents do. Um, and so if there's a way that to make it even more easily accessible than just another letter, I think that would go a long way. Um, I, I don't know how other board members feel uh, who currently have uh, students at the schools, um, but that's just my personal experience. Um, you know, aside from that, I think, you know, this is phenomenal work that we're doing. Um, and so I want to make sure that it's successful and that it works. Um, but I think that there's definitely um, that parent engagement piece too that still there's that disconnect, I feel. Um, I do want to echo what Trustee Shocker said about the Stop It app. Um, I think that was long overdue, so thank you so much for the amount of work that you're putting on um, getting that launched and uh, accessible to families. Um, 
going back to uh, the now pal, um, given that, and, and Michelle, you know, um, correct me if I'm um, have this wrong, but given the fact that we we do have um, families, um, you know, uh, waiting to have access to the social emotional. Uh, counselors or, or mental health clinicians and so forth. Um, it, have we looked at or thought about possibly expanding our reach and incorporating um, maybe some private agencies that can also offer that additional support? Um, I'm sure you probably thought about that already. But. <laughs> so we actually have the leadership group tomorrow and we're going to be engaging in that conversation of okay. how do we use additional partners above and beyond PVPSA in order to be able to provide the supports. And you know, I just want to make a note, we knew that the, those numbers were going to happen, right? Yeah. We knew that 12% of our students said that they had no supports. Um, and so part of what we did was look at how does tier one have to change, not only academically, but also social emotionally, because we knew that the system could not support 2,200 children who, if the numbers stayed true, we knew was gonna need that support. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, between May and our September survey, we asked the exact same questions, those numbers didn't improve. They didn't necessarily get worse, but 2,200 kids were still telling us that they needed a high level of intensity of support. So we do, as was mentioned, we do have to relook at what does that tier one look like yeah. because you will not have enough people, not PVPSA, not Salud, not Encompass, that can handle intensive supports for 2,200 children mm -hmm. um, and their families. So it's actually right. multiple. It's multiplicative. Um, so we're going to have that exact conversation tomorrow. We've already started that conversation, but we're we're in the middle of that. I think what NowPal will provide us, which is different than ever before, is we're going to be able to see which students with very high levels of accuracy have not been accessed yet. So if they haven't been accessed here, how can we send to a different agency, to a different group? Um, you know, I still think that we're going to have to continue to fortify the um, the, the tier one, and they didn't mention it, but they've already the two these two have already sent out through the supportive behaviorist and and our mental health clinicians a second set of lessons, um, and so I think you're right. You know, we need to continue to keep the parents engaged um, because they can be they can be part of that new tier one. Yeah, right. they really can. And um, so that's going to be our goal. But we're definitely looking to expand because every one of us is committed to supporting the students. And mm -hmm. we know we have um, some students and, frankly, staff out there suffering as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that was my other point. It, it's staff. You know, um, we can't forget about them either. Um, so I'm glad that that conversation has started. I'm happy to hear that. Um, and, and again, I don't want to sound too critical about the parent engagement piece, but I think it's, it, it is. It's another, um, you know, more people um, that can help address some of what we're seeing from starting from the home to the larger community. So but thank you. All right, thank you for taking the time for the presentation. Uh, Trustee DeSerpa, did you have a Just comment? wow, I mean, compared to what happened when I was in school, this is like a dream come true. So thank you for bringing it, implementing it, making sure we're, we have fidelity to this model and framework and um, go get them, keep it up. Thank you. All right, take care. All right, so on to section 11, our consent agenda. Um, consent agenda items are our routine items. Do we have any public speakers to consent? We do not. Are there any items that the board wishes to defer? All right, can I have a motion? I move to approve. I'll second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 
Any opposed? Motion carries 502. Um, let's see, so we don't have any deferred consent and we do not need to reconvene closed session. I'll go to 14, our uh, action report on closed session. Yes, so I have two motions and then some readouts. So um, motion one. For closed session item 2.2, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on October 13th, 2021 with 21 and 11 additional action items. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 502. Okay. Closed session item 2.3. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on October 13th, 2021 with 31 and 15 additional action items. You need a second? Yes, mm -hmm. I'll second. I got caught in the <laughs> All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 502. Okay. For item 2.1, student number 21-222-004, AHS. It's a staff recommendation of school administration is full expulsion for full calendar year starting the first day of suspension. It was approved by the board in vote of 502. For item 2.1, student ID 21-22-005 AHS is recommended, sorry, recommendation of school administration for full expulsion. It was approved by the board in a 502 vote. And for item 2.6, special education settlement for student, the board voted with a 502 vote to approve the final compromise and release agreement for a special services student. And then I do have two announcements. The Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Antoinette Dracinis as the new coordinator of child development. Antoinette has been serving students since 2000 as a teacher, director at Head Start, and at First Five Language and Literacy Coach, and most recently as a teacher site supervisor for PVUSD. After attending Cabrillo College, Antoinette went to CSUMB to earn her BA in Liberal Studies with an emphasis on child development. Antoinette brings her 21 plus years of experience to this new role of coordinator. We are proud to welcome this highly accomplished educator to her new administrative role. Then on behalf of our superintendent and district administration, we are pleased to announce Mr. Jacques Lake's appointment to supervisor of maintenance and operations. Mr. Lake brings to the Parho Valley Unified School District a wide breadth of experience in facilities planning and maintenance, project management, and working with a variety of agencies and stakeholders. Mr. Lake built his career in the private sector and worked on school projects establishing safety systems, evacuation systems, and wireless clock systems. Mr. Mr. Lake is a good listener and is solution oriented. He looks forward to serving the students and staff of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District and continuing the good work of improving district facilities. We are proud to welcome Mr. Lake to our district as the new supervisor, maintenance and operations. Thank you. All right, our next meeting will be on October 27th, 2021. And with that, our meeting is adjourned at 10.54 p.m. Good night, everyone.